see it kind of begin. I'm kind of honored to be this young <laughs> council. New experience to the specs. Everyone, we will get started in a couple of minutes. I realize it's six o'clock and we're still taking care of a couple of formalities. to first meeting of the pros commission parks recs and open space i'm mike berger i'm the public works director for the city of sonoma and i am going to be the acting chair until we elect a chair <laughs> just so that we can navigate our way to that point tonight and we're going to do it quick um, rebecca do you want to give a little bit of background on how to use the microphones Sure. Are you calling the meeting to order? Oh. I am calling this meeting to order. <laughs> okay. So just um, when you're using your mic, um, obviously you just push the button. If you're not speaking, make sure your mic is 
not red, it's turned off because it does cause a um, short in the other mics. Just something to remember. Uh, make sure you speak into your mic because the meeting is being streamed and recorded. So if you are not talking into your mic or your mic's not on, we can't hear you. So other than that, um, that's just a little bit. Excellent, thank you. And the agenda that I wanted to just go over really quickly tonight, um, we've convened a call to order and uh, Kathy or Rebecca, could you do roll call please? John Donnelly. Here. Sinjin Bain. Katrina Lennon. Here. Jessica Miseraka. Here. Charlie Tolbert. Here. Brendan Tierney. Here. Thank you. Uh, pu public participation tonight is on Zoom, and there's a link to that on the city's website. As far as approval of the agenda, I'm going to go ahead and ask if there's any comments from the public on the agenda. Is that right, Rebecca? Comments from the public? Not at this point. I, I would suggest this evening, since the um, commission, you don't have a chair yet, that you forego, you um, continue the approval of the agenda for tonight, it's staff as staff presented. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and continue the approval of the agenda as staff presented, and we're going to move on. The next item is the presentation of pros. Actually, we need to go to public comment. This is where the individuals who um, do not have anything on the agenda that they would like to comment in, they can um, come up and comment for three minutes on items not appearing on the agenda. So if, there, if you have something that's not on the agenda, then you can come up and speak for three minutes. Please come up and state your name. All right, so while they're looking at the agenda to see, we could go to see if anyone on Zoom has general public comment. No one's raising their hand. So if anyone has general public comment on items not on the agenda, this would be the time to approach the dais. Please state your name. Not seeing any, we're gonna move on. As first business, item of business, item 3.1, uh, I wanted to review the authorizing resolution for the committee, just to give everybody a brief rehash that on March 2nd, 2022, and I'm reading the agenda item summary from May 18th, 2022, that author authorized the uh, pros and the CAC committee on March 2nd, 2022, where the City Council directed changes be made to the Municipal Code to dissolve the CSEC, create a new Parks, Rec, and Open Space Committee, and also create a new Climate Action Committee, they also direct, directed that the Tree Committee responsibilities be added to the new Parks, Recs, and Open Space Committee. Regarding the Parks, Recs, and Open Space Committee, the purpose of the committee shall be to advise the City Council on matters related to the preservation and enhancement of the parks, recreational facilities, and open space under the jurisdiction of the City and shall be governed by Chapter 2.4 of the Sonoma Municipal Code and any rules and procedures established by City Council resolution. It shall be composed of seven members. Five, members, five of the committee members shall be voting members who shall be qualified electors of the City with each city council member making one direct appointee appointment to the committee. One non-voting member shall be an arborist certified by the International Society of Arboriculture 
and other non-voting members shall be a youth member who shall be at least 14 years of age but not older than 18 years of age at the time of appointment. The two non-voting members shall be appointed by the City Council and shall be residents of the City or the Greater Sonoma Valley as defined by the Council Commission and Committee Appointment Policy. The Parks, Rec, and Open Space Committee shall act in an advisory capacity to the City Council in matters pertaining to 1. The planning and implementation of new recreation facilities and services 2. Open space acquisition and preservation 3. The restoration of important habitat areas within the city and well, four proposed improvements or modifications to existing street thoroughfares, including but not limited to sidewalk areas, city parks, cemeteries, trails, bikeways, and related facilities. Five, policies related to the use of the plaza and other city parks, not including review or approval of special event permits. Six, policies and programs related to tree preservation and expanding tree planting opportunities in the city, including but not limited to public rights of way. Seven, the functions of the tree committee under chapter 12.08 of the Sonoma Municipal Code. And eight, other duties and responsibilities as delegated by the city council. In addition to this, um, Parks and Rec, uh, there was a Parks and Rec work plan that is in four phases and will pr be presented shortly as part of another um, presentation. And then uh, two sections of the municipal code, section 2.48 is, um, is uh, describes Parks, Recs, and Open Space, and 12.08, the tree ordinance, and those are both in the binders that we gave you tonight. With that, uh, brief history, I'm going to go ahead and move on to item four. And Rebecca, do I, I don't need a public comment on that, do I? Presentation? Typically we do not, but you have your, um, you have Sinjin Bain who raised his hand, and I don't know if he had general public comment or um, he raised it after we closed it, so that's up to you if you want to allow him to speak. Yeah, we can go ahead and have him speak on um, public comment on item three. Sinjin, I'm going to bring you in for three minutes. Hi, this is Sinjin. How are y'all doing? Um, can you hear me? Just want to make sure. sure. Yes. Great. Great. Thanks, Thanks Rebecca. Rebecca. <laughs> um, I just wanted to um, make a quick comment um, that I have been looking at the agenda and um, there are several different sort of components in it and I hope I am not overstepping, but I'm just hoping as um, as the group goes down a, a path of, in the process that one of the things that I think we ought to be looking at uh, is under the sort of the, the guys and hope hope you all look at this is uh, specifically how all this um, all of the uh, public spaces and parks um, may may be relevant to the process that we went through with parklets so I just wanted to um, have people in their minds maybe be thinking about um, how parklets relate to our parks and plazas and um, open spaces. Thanks. That's all I've got. Rebecca, that's it for public comment? Yes. Okay, we'll bring public comment to a close. And moving on to item four, which is our regular calendar, and item 4.1, the election of the chair. So this is where I'm going to open up to committee members to have a discussion. Typically in this situation, the um, this is where you select your mayor and the next item is your vice chair, your um, chair and your vice chair. Um, that individual will serve in the role of chair for the um, year that's done at the first meeting in the new year um, each year. And so the way the process works is you call for, we'll call for nominations and um, once there's no need for seconds, an individual, you, uh, you raise your hand recognized and make your nomination and then anybody else who has a different nomination um, will call all the nominations and then 
Once that is done, then the um, we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Kathy, I'll do a roll call vote starting with the first person that's nominated, and you can go through them until someone is um, has the uh, full support of the commission or a quorum. So that's if the first individual who's nominated, if during the roll call, if there's multiple, if they are the person with the most support, then that will be the chairperson. And then once that has happened, the chairperson will move to the center seat. Okay. So it's over to us at this point? Yeah, it's for you to uh, make nominations. Okay. <clears throat> Go ahead. I would like to nominate Trina. I think we, we should discuss, um, you know, we don't know one another at all or backgrounds or anything to this point. So if anyone has an interest in being the chair, um, I'm going to bow out on this just <laughs> for the sake of this conversation, um, opening it up if anyone has experience and or experience with a committee such as this in any capacity, nonprofit and or public um, to sort of give us that that background um, and or interest in being um, one of these two positions, chair or vice chair, um, you know, let's talk about it and then we'll nominate. Does that sound good? Okay, cool. I have zero experience with a commission such as this, so I'm here to, to contribute and learn and um, uh, it doesn't mean I'm not going to raise my hand, but I but I um, would love to hear from some other of my fellow commissioners. Hi there. I would like to nominate John Donnelly as chair. I've known John for about a year and a half. John has served for more than 10 years on the Overlook Trail um, group at stewards as chair uh, over a decade and has been there since the beginning. And I've known John to be incredibly diplomatic <laughs> so that's my nominee thank you Jess I am um, I would accept that nomination since it's for a year and um, and what welcome you as, as vice chair if you're so willing Trina I have had a little experience I was on the Community Service and Environmental Commission for two years before we divided into the, the new committee I was not a chair, but I have some sense of how the meetings are conducted, and it is a learning curve. So um, if you will um, be willing to forgive me from time to time, I, I would be okay to accept the nomination. Thank you. Well, I, 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 I just met him, and this, but this guy seems really cool. Seems <laughs> like he knows what he's talking about. You know, I, I'm the youngest one on here. They said they wanted somebody young, you know. I may not be an idiot, but I'm not dumb. If that makes any sense. <laughs> but yeah, he seems he seems like a good um participant. I just think um also like I would like to be like uh maybe the vice next to him. That way we got two generations, you know, thinking the same way, trying to help people. You know. Okay. It's just two yeah. two different generations. Mm -hmm. And just to clarify, alternates cannot be chair or vice chair. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, then I'll be in my chair. <laughs> yeah, this one right here, this normal chair. Yeah, commission members, every commission member is, you know, that's a very important position. All commission it. members, yeah. I get it. I just like, yeah, I just like making people laugh, having fun, and trying to make the world a better place, so. Well, I'm good with um, our two nominees, uh, especially in light of the fact that uh, I prefer not to be in either role. Mike, quick question for you. Do we take into account the commission member who is not present at this time? How does that work? And or can we ask him since we know he's on the line if he has interest in either position or I, I don't know how that works. Okay. Yeah, we can open this up to public comment and the dialogue that I'm hearing is really good. Great. And okay. do we have just clarify? I was just trying to clarify with Kathy. Yeah. Do we have a nomination for vice chair? Yes, I nominated Trina. Okay. 
No, no, no. I, well, I feel comfortable with John as chair, and I'm ready to motion that we do so or vote or whatever we need to do. <laughs> Feels like that, that would be it, if somebody on the commission wants to make a motion. I motion to elect John as chair. Do we have a second? Okay, we don't need a second. We just take a vote. Yeah, we'll just take a vote for John Donnelly as chair. And Kathy will do a roll call. Okay, John Donnelly. Aye. Katrina. Aye. Sorry, Flynn. Yeah, that's Je <laughs> Jessica Miseraka. Aye. Charlie Tolbert. Aye. Brendan Tierney. Aye. Okay. Motion carries unanimous unanimously. Yay. Oh <laughs> yeah. And Chair Donnelly, if we could have you and Council Member Brandon Tierney, switch places, please. Commissioner Tierney. Never been called commissioner in my life. Can we open up for public comment or we have to do vice chair next? Yeah, we can go ahead and open up for public comment if anybody in the public would like to step up to the microphone. Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Matt Metzler and I um, am uh, served on uh, for five years on the Community Services and Environment Commission, three of them with uh, John, so I think you guys made an excellent choice and I think he'll do a, do a, a really great job. I also, also just wanted to comment uh, to all of you that um, in my experience when I got on the CSEC, I was just very impressed from the get-go with the quality of support and the amount, the, the good job the city staff did. You guys are really lucky we have a uh, great city staff. It's I'm used to being you know, in uh, uh, running meetings where I have to do everything myself too. So it's nice to have somebody else who does the agenda and runs the meeting and everything. So uh, you guys are in good hands. So congratulations. We do not. Is that it for public comment of people present tonight? It looks like that's it. Rebecca, do we have anybody on Zoom? We do. I'm going to bring in Sinjin Bain again. I, 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 I love, love the smile, smile on Mike's, Mike's face, face. <laughs> waiting for me to come on Zoom. Um, I just wanted to echo the last public speaker and um, express appreciation for the process of all the dialogue between the commissioners uh, working through chair and vice chair. And I fully support everything that you guys are doing and how the votes are going. Thanks. Okay, we'll bring uh, public comment to a close. Now, um, Chair Donnelly, uh, the next item of business is to elect a vice chair. And if you wanted to take lead on that, which is basically going to be a repeat of what we just did, um, you can go ahead and do that, which is, you know, just soliciting more um, opinions from the commission. Thank you. So. We have a nomination for vice chair with Trina. Are there any other nominations coming forward at this point? Hearing none, um, I would entertain a motion to. I move elect. to approve Katrina Lennon. Yeah, we'll go to um, public comment first. Sorry about that. Okay. So, Rebecca, do we have any public comment? Any public comment in the council chambers tonight on this item? Seeing none, we'll go to Zoom. There's no public comment on Zoom, and we'll close public comment. Okay. I think we're ready for the vote. Would you call the vote, please? And hey, Rebecca, we're, we're okay.
Okay, uh, we're going to do roll call, and Katrina Lennon has been nominated for vice chair. Kathy, would you please do roll call? John Donnelly. Aye. Katrina Lennon. Aye. Jessica Miseraka. Aye. Charlie Tolbert. Aye. Brendan Tierney. I don't think that would work out well for me. <laughs> but I'm always going to be an alternate. <laughs> no, we're voting on Jessica being the vice chair. Katrina. Uh, Katrina. Sorry, Jessica. I, I, Sorry, would, Katrina. I, would, I would say Katrina. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. That was 5-0 for Katrina Lennon to be the vice chair. Orders of business one and two are out of the way, and we're moving on to item number 4.3. And item number 4.3 is going to be a little less procedural, a little less procedural, and it is a presentation by Lisa Jansen on the REC program overview. So as I'm, whoops, as I'm waiting for my PowerPoint slide to get up. Um, Good evening, commissioners and Chair Donnelly. Um, we're excited that you're all seated and, and that we're ready to go with the pros. It's, it's been a while. So um, uh, yeah, that's not the, f hold on one moment. And you know what, I'll go ahead and dive in and we'll see if we, I can't catch up. Um, so the city of uh, Son Sonoma has a long history of providing funding to various recreation and community service initiatives through annual grant funding, one-time investments in facilities, utility subsidies, subsidies financial um, support for leases and or low um, annual lease rates of, for properties um, or, or buildings. Um, in addition, the city has traditionally supported many community events and activities by waiving uh, or reducing the city fees at times providing direct and also providing direct financial uh, support. The city also has supported nonprofits through the years for one-time initiatives um, and opportunities. And I'm gonna bring one just one example to the forefront, which is when the Sonoma Valley Museum of Art approaches us for their annual, hasn't been annual recently, but it was for a while, their temporary art exhibit. That would be an, an example of that one-time um, new initiative and yes. how City Council would support it. Can just for those of you, if you if your monitor is not on, there's a button in the bottom left hand corner that you can turn it on so you'll be able to be with the presentation. Okay, and with that, can we go to slide two? Oh, sorry. Thanks, Oriana. Oop. <laughs> um, so quickly, uh, back in 20, uh, 2016, uh, the city council directed the city manager at that time to create a policy that we could follow. We had a lot of, like I said, we had file folders of lease agreements and partner agreements and all of those wonderful things, but we d didn't really have a, a policy that we were following. So um, out of those discussions came our recreation and community services policy. And this is really the funding document um, that provides kind of an outline of how we manage our recreational partners. Um, I think it's really important to say that, you know, again, reiterate, we don't actually have a recreations department. We have a lovely parks department. They do a lot of wonderful ma maintenance and ground work and keep our parks beautiful, but we don't have a recreation department. So we have con um, continually relied on these partnerships over the years. So this policy really provides uh, multi-year contracts with our key nonprofits. Currently, there's four of them. Uh, they are the Boys and Girls Club, Sonoma Valley, uh, sorry, uh, Sonoma Ecology Center, the Vintage House, and uh, Sonoma Community Center are the four core nonprofits. Um, and so each of those, every three years, we enter into another agreement and we pay them a stipend to help provide um, funding for programming for our community. Um, we also provide, like I said earlier, fee waivers and financial support for events um, and fee waivers for uh, community events as well. 
uh, and, and those seasonal events like our winter programming this year. We actually had a winter programming. I hope everyone was able to enjoy some of it. We had music performances and um, a couple other uh, activations on the plaza this year. Um, and then discretionary funding to support those unique projects, like I mentioned, the Sonoma Valley Museum of Art projects and others that come our way. Um, and then we our fifth policy item really had a focus on enhancement of the recreation and community services web page on the city's website uh, to, provide, to provide more information to the public because when you don't have a recreations department you don't have a directory that gets or a, a um, catalog that gets published a couple times a year and so really trying to pull all of our community partners together and demonstrate that we have recreation it's just not something that the city is programming we help fund it we help with coordination of some of the aspects, but we actually aren't the ones doing the, the, the programming. And uh, as I mentioned, our four core community partners are very professional entities, and they do a lot of programming, and we're really fortunate to have such amazing community partners in our valley. So next slide, please. So this slide is awfully small font, and I ap apologize for everyone that's in the audience, but uh, this kind of outlines the type of recreation and community services we have here in Sonoma. Um, I think there's, so we, we broke it into these five categories, and I think we could actually add maybe a couple other ones. Um, but right now, it's community facilities. That includes our parks, our heritage center, meeting rooms that we might have available. Um, uh, Fields. I'm trying to think. Um, you know, the high school just recently did a major remodel, and they have the, uh, pickleball courts that I think are the best kept secret here in Sonoma, um, and uh, basketball courts, etc. So that really kind of falls into that community facilities uh, part. The second one is youth programming, um, and as you can see, there's always tons of youth programming happening here in Sonoma Valley. If it's leagues, and or um, uh, workshops, um, skills, and drills, you name it, we have it here in Sonoma. Uh, senior programming, a lot of this is done through the vintage, uh, vintage House, but also when you start looking at our service organizations, we have Bocce here tonight. Um, they help with a lot of this programming and providing those additional services to our community. Um, and then adult programming, that could be everything, anything from your um, adult softball, adult baseball leagues, um, I don't know if we have adult soccer here. I think there's, there is some organizations, but I haven't nailed that one down, and we'll get to that a little bit later is how we continue to try to build on this. Um, and then our cultural, um, cultural arts. And so we have everything from the, the city has a culture and fine arts commission um, that we work closely with, um, but then we also have a series of events that kind of fall into that, um, including our vintage festival, et cetera. So next slide. Sorry, I'm kind of belating this. <laughs> Uh, so this this slide really identifies our core tier one partners. Uh, those are the ones that are getting the funding. Um, and then the, all the additional partnerships. Now everyone on this list is receiving some sort of su support from the city. Um, you look at the Field of Dreams, they get a financial support from us as well as they lease for a dollar a year uh, the fields and but maintain them for us and they help program those fields by working with all the different leagues in our, in our valley. Um, to Splash's new pool, which we're all excited about. Um, I want to also point out that, you know, something that's kind of unusual is that uh, Sonoma County Regional Parks, we have islands within our city, um, namely parks, and the city subsidized those water, the water to keep those fields green. So, you know, we do, we do a lot, and now we're trying to capture it and really communicate it back um, to the community members and, uh, and tell the story, I think, a little bit better than what we have in the past. So next slide, please. Uh, youth programming, again, our core three up at the top, um, and then all the additional ones. Um, I listed a few of the kids' events that are coming up, like the Seroptimus uh, Egg Hunt, which is, I think, April 8th this year. Um, and then we also support our local high school through um, waiving the fees for the homecoming parade and the event that they do on the plaza to painting City Hall green um, for homecoming week and graduation week and putting up banners. And so we really do support our community in many different ways. Next slide, please. Um, the senior program programming, uh, I think if I asked just about anyone, they would always probably go to the Vintage House and say, oh, that's where, we, where I go. But uh, we're starting to find that there's a lot of additional programming going out there. 
Um, I do want to point something out here. I did put SOS, which is Sonoma Overnight Support, into this category. And that's kind of that one when I said that we could probably do six or seven categories. I think really there's, there's some community services that we provide that um, maybe deserve their own column. And so, um, but SOS provides showers here at the Haven, laundry services, they do our safe parking program, and so it's definitely a community service for, our, for the Valley. Next slide, please. And then all the different adult programming um, down to, you know, Sonoma Historical Society that does lecture series and et cetera, and we have Sonoma Home Winemakers, which I think was new for me. Um, I This one was kind of uncovered for me. Uh, when, I, um, when a gentleman reached out and said, hey, I'm with this organization, I was like, you are? Uh, we have the Texwan Park, which is down at Leveroni and, what's the, not Fire Creek, in Fire Creek. Um, but it's it's a couple acres of vineyards, and uh, there's an organization that we that leases the property from the city, and uh, they make wine and they do wine workshops, and there's a whole community around winemaking here in the valley. So, again, diverse group of of uh, services that are provided to our community. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, and then this is the last of these slides, but it goes back to the Sonoma Valley, uh, Sonoma Valley Museum of Art with their um, outdoor temporary art displays that they do, or art installations, um, down to things like La Luz and their Cinco de Mayo event. So, you know, in the case of some of the events, it's just the fee waivers, um, but in other areas, you know, there's, there's funding that actually goes back to the Sonoma Valley Museum of Art a little bit that helps cover like the steel plates that the artwork sets on. So they do a lot of coordination. They should get all the credit for everything they do because it's a big lift. And uh, we're super lucky to have the museum as one of our partners. Next slide. So we're in an interesting time. So back during uh, our fiscal budgeting season, I think it was about April of last year, for we were budgeting for our fiscal 22-23, so this, this, this year, um, it became really apparent when I did my presentation um, and started working on my all the information. I mean, it's about a $900,000 budget is what falls into the community services. It's a fairly large budget. There was a lot of questions about where's the money going and who are we funding and who do we support? And so one of the things as a staff member, um, you know, in the past we really only had our four core partners come up and present. And those were the ones we were actually giving money to. Um, but they were required through our, our, part, our agreements to come and present to city council every year their an annual report. So this year, we've actually expanded it. We're in the middle of it. Uh, if, you, I, if you missed uh, the last city council meeting, that's where we started. And we had um, Bachi, Patonk, uh, and Sonoma Ecology Center were the three that presented that evening. Um, this, this next meeting, uh, next Wednesday, we have Sonoma Community Center and Boys and Girls Club, and I'm trying to think third one. I just finished the report today. Sorry, Rebecca. I'm trying to remember the third, Boys and Girls Community Center, and sorry. It'll come to me. I'll fill you in just a second. Um, often works that way. So anyways, over the course of what was going to be three weeks or three different council meetings, uh, we've just recently expanded it because there was about an hour and 20 minutes of good dialogue uh, over those three presentations. So not wanting to um, cut anyone short, we decided to expand it into one more meeting. So now we're going into April 19th. Um, I think it's also really important that out of the community services, there's also two other entities that get funding from us, and that's the Sonoma Valley uh, Chamber of Commerce, they're our economic development uh, group, and then uh, we fund the Sonoma Visitors Bureau through lease agreements. So um, those are two others that kind of makes up that seventh category, I would say, of, of types of things that we do within that um, budget. So let's see, the goal with doing these annual presentations is really to quickly bring our city council members up to speed. I'm including all the agreements as part of the, the council packets. So it's a really, it's a long read, but it, it's very insightful, it provides a lot of background information. And it also starts to demonstrate the longevity of these relationships. 
some of them have been around for many, many years. Um, and so the goal really is during our fiscal t budget session for 23-24 is really to be able to have a, a nice dialogue with our city council and um, discuss our community partners and and make some uh, decisions on, on funding and, and if we need to change some of our agreements around because we want to see an emphasis on one particular area or the other, uh, this would give us an opportunity to kind of hear that. So next slide. Sorry. I'm Yes, please. Sorry. Okay. So the three that are going to be presenting next week are Sonoma Health and Recreation That's Association, correct. Splash, Boys and Girls Club, and Sonoma Community Center. Yes. Sorry about that. Paul Favreau would not be happy with me. I forgot him. Um, so really, like I said, super excited to have the pool uh, at the high school. That was a real wonderful gift to our community. Um, so quickly, going into 2019, we had a community member, Karen Collins. I think some of you might know her. Uh, she approached City Council and made the request that, you know, we have all of these partners and we might not be doing the best job that we could in promoting them and talking about them and maybe there's gaps in some of our programming and we really just at that point didn't know so um, back in December of 2020 uh, City Council um, made the decision to create this Recreation and Parks Task Force. Uh, Karen Collins was the chair along with Steve Page. Uh, we had six community members. Uh, some were members of uh, regional parks and, uh, and our school district. And then we had one youth representative and seven of the city's recreation community partners were also on that task force. Next page, or next slide. So when we launched this, and this is really background information for you, um, but when we launched the Recreation um, or Parks or Recreation and Parks Task Force, uh, they were they had a mission. It was a work plan that was uh, created in conjunction with uh, Karen Collins. But this kind of outlines that it's a little bit of abbreviated to the one that was in your packet, but it gives you some ideas of of like the scope of work that we're really looking to accomplish. So. Under phase one was really to do an inventory analysis. We spent a lot of time on that. Um, and in that, uh, the original plan was to create some sort of catalog or, or directory. Um, and I, I think you know, what we ended up with was our directory um, that you'll see, and I'll talk about it in a little bit more detail. But on the city's website, now we have a directory. And um, I'm going to pause. Actually, no, I'm not going to pause. I'll keep going. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail of the directory in just a second. But uh, park improvements, um, there's a couple things that uh, fall and I think might continue to fall here. But we have Measure M funding that we receive every year, sales tax sales tax initiative um, and so in this phase two of future park improvements really wanting to use the CSCC at the time as that uh, p that entity that would help us vet those measure and projects and really give the public an opportunity to to provide some feedback on those projects because there is a, a public component to those projects um, and at the time we had identified uh, a list of items that we have uh, moved forward with a few but have um, pause on others. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail there because I know Oriana's up behind me. Uh, but city parks and recreation benchmark assessment, this was something that we made a lot of progress on. Uh, Karen Collins, with the help of the Catalyst Foundation, uh, received a $40,000 grant. And that money was used to hire an entity called the Pratera Group. And they went out and they benchmarked against the city of Sonoma, against I think it was seven other cities. Um, I actually haven't received, I have the written report, but I haven't received the report from Karen or the Petrera Group, so I'm actually waiting. And, um, and I'm excited to say that we'll bring that back to you probably at the next meeting, because I'm really interested to hear um, more on that report. And then last but not least, uh, we had this Park and Recreation Master Plan. Now this was going to be, a, this is a long haul project. I know we said in here it was going to start, it hasn't started yet. and. Um, it's not clear if this is going to continue or if it's going to morph into something else, but I'm hoping that we'll have some more clarity in the in the future on this item. Uh, but really, the goal was to try to outline the scope of what what we need, uh, the needs assessment based on phase two, and um, really develop a funding mechanism to fund some of these bigger park projects that we that we had in mind. So we can change the next slide. And like I said, this is background information. This isn't 
transferring to you as this is what you need to do, but just wanted to kind of give you the background so that you understood kind of the work that went into where we are today. Um, so recreation organizations and opportunities, um, this directory was pr a pretty much a labor of love. Lots of entities, we did a lot of outreach. Um, it includes groups like Folklorica out in the valley. We didn't keep it just to those groups that are participating in recreation and programming here in Sonoma. We actually expanded it out to the valley. It includes the regional parks, it includes um, Jack Linden Park. I think we took it all the way as far north as, as Kenwood and then everything down to Shellville or 37. Um, learned a lot. It was lovely and I would encourage you all to go and just look at it and just kind of click around. But I think what's unique about this is um, the directory really, one of the key components, at least when I entered into this kind of work plan, was really wanting to make sure that we were able to identify those enti those organizations that were doing programming that were was accessible, um, not just from a language perspective, but financially as well. And to date, we hadn't really had that. It was like everyone had their own websites and they all have their own programs. But really what this directory did is, in my mind, it was kind of, um, the biggest gift it gave us was the ability to kind of look and see that there's subsidies, there's sliding scales, and those organiza organizations have self-identified themselves as offering dual, um, dual language programming, et cetera. So huge benefit that, that this task force um, gave to our community by doing all of this important work. Um, and then again, uh, it, the current directory is broken into these seven categories. It's art and culture or art and culture, athletic, sports, and fitness programs. Again, we never had a real clear picture of all the different leagues here in Sonoma Valley. And I bet there's probably one or two that we still don't have, but it really went deep into all the leagues. Um, I'm not gonna go through the list. Everyone can read. Next one. <laughs> so really, uh, the future, in my mind, uh, things that I would like to continue to work on uh, with with city council's blessing and with uh, some direction from our pros is work with our recreation work with the recreational partners and other nonprofit organizations to help market their great work that they're already doing for our community. I don't feel the need to have to create a recreations department and compete with these organizations. They're highly professional, very adept groups of of professional people that do this for a living and. Uh, I think you know what we could do is just help get the message out and help them market themselves and ensure that you know every school child knows what type of summer programming is available and not just from the the one or two entities that gets included into their um, you know their their flyers as part of their school loops. So um, quarterly newsletters with special focuses on recreation. I, you know the city sends out not quite every week, but. Uh, a couple times a month uh, newsletters, but I think there's some opportunity there to kind of grow that program. Talk about summer camp, maybe it's a summer camp edition. We could talk about after school programming, senior programming, and parks and open spaces, and really kind of talk about, you know, um, and highlight and feature some of these amazing organizations that are doing great work. So, uh, again, uh, there is with every online program, there is this need that we have to continue to engage with all these partners because their information is up on the city's website. So um, that takes some time. And so moving forward, we'll need to kind of continue to kind of reach out. At least now we have point of contacts with all these groups and uh, I'm super excited by that because that, when we started, we didn't. Um, but now we actually have emails that we can send people information, say, hey, look at the directory and update it with your current information or if anything has changed. So uh, also what's nice, I feel like I'm losing my voice. Also what's nice on the directory is there's a feedback button. Um, I think oftentimes, you know, you if you can't find something, it's you go, oh gosh, I didn't find it. And you continue to search or you you just forget about it and so I think really uh, that feedback feedback button is something that I'd like to actually see included in some of our marketing because I think it gives our community an ability to um, ask questions and ask for additional programming where needed so 
And then, like I said earlier, I think at a future pros meeting, um, having the chair and co-chair who did an amazing amount of work um, really present this benchmark assessment to, to you and then hopefully get it in front of uh, city council shortly after. So next slide. Oh, I can't forget special events. So uh, my background is on special events. Uh, we do a lot of special events. Um, so annually, the city plans 20 plus farmers markets. Uh, we do the city party in August, and I put the date of the next city party, August 3rd. We do the Alcaldi reception, treasure artist receptions, and then on the plaza and in Depot Park, we have anywhere from 13 to 15 uh, annual large-scale events. Um, we have a very, and I should have hit this as the first bullet point, but we have a special events policy that's very uh, detailed. Um, and that is really my uh, my guiding document in allowing and, and approving applications that we receive. So like I said, those 13 to 15 annual large-scale events, those are events that have been happening for many, many years. Uh, Vintage Festival is on its 126th year this year um, and that is now being organized by the vintners and growers which is you know super exciting it's a nice alignment and then uh, to our annual fourth of July parade so the city subsidized the fourth of July parade uh, we waive all the parade fees uh, we pay for uh, it's almost about forty thousand dollars worth of public uh, safety so police and 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 uh, response um, as well as there's a lot of Mike Berger's team's time <laughs> spent with road closures and no parking and and dropping off the sand at the at the launch site so there's just a lot of work that the city does to support uh, the community in many different ways um and then the last bullet point was just the plaza and depot park so outside of those really big events that we all see uh, as a community member you, everyone's always welcome to come down to the plaza and have a special event if it's your birthday or a baby shower or whatever in some cases I do get organizations that want to reserve a section because they're inviting members of their family and they want to say it's going to be in the southeast quadrant or section one of Depot Park um, so I do a lot of uh, small-scale events as well but also in the small-scale event uh, events the Jazz Society the four concerts that they have a year would fall under that as well. So uh, music in place, I think last year they did a total of six or seven concerts in the amphitheater and they're looking to, wanting to see that expand. And uh, so there's, we do a lot of holiday programming, we do art shows, you name it, we have it. I really do feel that way. Uh, I think one of the only things we don't have is a Grand Fondo. And for people that like to bike, I'd love to see that brought back. I just haven't found someone that wants to uh, spearhead that. <laughs> as I look at Mr. Metzler. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, conclusions. So uh, I'd like to just open it up for questions. I don't know if I have all the answers, but because uh, like I said, I'm still learning. Any questions? You have a tremendous amount on your plate. <laughs> it's, in, it's incredible. And I, I think, you know, I'll speak for myself, but one of the, the greatest draws about moving to Sonoma was the gatherings of this mm -hmm. town and just how often the community is brought together for these various events that happen throughout the year. So I think it's one of the most charming things about this place and should be preserved and taken care of and um, appreciated for all the hard work that um, the city does to, to put that on. It is no small feat um, to do all of that. Well, thank you. Um, I want to double click just a little bit on programming yes. and some questions I have around uh, the contract, the multi-year contracts you have. Yes. Um, without getting into the specific, the financial specifics, that's all you know boring. We can get to later. But in general, what what obligations do those organizations have to sort of keep you updated? I mean, I sort of feel like you're an allocator, right, of of the funding, and therefore those organizations should be. Um, should have a responsibility and an accountability to the city to update, you know, to keep up to date the city with all of their programming so that we can be in a position to identify gaps going forward. For mm -hmm. example, you know, does Sonoma Community Center talk to the Boys and Girls Club about their various programming? Are they, are they duplicative? Do they have the same, do they have a pottery class happening on the same night? I'm just making this up. Yeah. but. You know things like that, and and the city wouldn't necessarily want to take on the responsibility of you know 
you have, again, too much on your plate, clearly. Um, but I'm just curious from a, you're, they're getting funding, so what is their responsibility back to you to sort of, you know, prove out how they're using those funds for the benefit of the community? Well, and, and it differs depending, our agreements aren't completely the same. Um, sure. Here's one small example. And let me just start with, I would just highly recommend you looking at the, your city council packet. Um, it gets posted this Friday for next week. And it actually has the agreements for Splash, has the agreements for the Boys and Girls Center and uh, or the Boys and Girls Club as well as Sonoma um, Community Center. And so I think what's always amazing to me is, you know, we pay this much of their budgets that are this big. Um, and so the the responsibility back to us is really has been this annual report. Um, in the case of, and I'm just going to continue to use Sonoma Community Center because they're fabulous. Uh, they're all fabulous, but what I like about them is like there's a clause in there that uh, the community center runs our volunteer management list. So if we got into an emergency and we needed to call volunteers up to help, if it's set up a shelter, if it's to do food services, et cetera, um, the Sonoma Community Center actually manages that list for us. And, um, and so we've been working, it's now Vanessa, uh, but prior it was Charlotte at the Community Center, the ED, and there's just constant communication back and forth with, the, with these groups. So you know that's just one example, but there's meetings, you know, that group met last week and it was the county was involved Sonoma Ecology or the um, Sonoma Collaborative was on the call um, City of Sonoma I'm trying to think who else uh, usually Maite from the Springs Max that's in on those calls so it's a v collaborative approach and I think that's really where we're trying to move is that you know none of these one none of these organizations just manage programs for the city of Sonoma I mean it it's really a valley initiative, and I think that's kind of how we're looking at it at this point. Um, so, like I said, when you only contribute this much of a really big budget, it's really hard to ask for too many commitments from them, but I think some of the areas that, like I said, I would like to start to, to really see movement on, and a lot of the organizations are already doing this, but just making sure that there's an equity metric. You know, does, is your programming, um, are you programming for our community? You know, does it doesn't match the demographic of our community? Are we programming in dual languages? Are we are the fees um, set in such a way that it, it, classes are accessible for people? Um, and so I think you know, as I'm looking at moving those reports, and of course I'm not, I take direction, but those would be some of the areas that I would like to see some more involvement on. Um, as well as just trying to understand if there's something we're missing. I think that's the big thing is we have so much, it's just hard to kind of keep your arms around it and yeah. really do an assessment. So without the community stepping up and saying, hey, I noticed that in Mill Valley or wherever, they offer X, can we do something like that? You know, if it isn't, we need the community to be involved in this. Yeah. So. And in an ideal world, I've clicked around on the website for mm -hmm the recreation programming that you, you the work that I guess the park excuse me the task force and you worked on and it's great I mean it is all there it's mm -hmm. just um, challenging to navigate because there's so many different organizations right. you know you can't offer a transaction of signing up for no. the class via the website which is perfectly fine um, but there's no you know sort of draw if I wanted to play bocce you know could right. I go to a drop down that took me to the bocce website so that I could have access so to that all the links should be functioning on the website yeah for which there are a lot, a lot. of them yes. you know you could go down a rabbit hole right. of links right. um, but yes like I said it's all there um, I just think I think there's uh, opportunity to sort of reach a broader set of community members um, via that directory and mm -hmm. just keeping that you know up to date so anyways I'll pause there but that was those are all really good comments yeah any other comments questions got the right button there thank you that that's uh, a lot to cover as Trina said and it's um, we're all trying to catch up with you and make sure we've got, got this under <laughs> we understand it um, this is more a comment that I think we can address at the end of the meeting when we get into comments and what the future agenda might be. But I really would like to pick up on the fact that the task force on parks and recreation didn't complete its work. We're stuck at, at phase three with the Potero groups 
recommendations. And I'm kind of thinking it would, I don't know if this would work, but I'm wondering if we shouldn't have a, a study session just to have the Patero Group um, report uh, to us and invite Karen Collins and Steve Page, anybody else from the task force, to come and have a work through so that we kind of understand what's in that report. And it ties in, of course, to what happens to Measure M money. Uh, we're already three years into the Measure M money, and we have, what, seven left to go. And the idea was to use this report and the other things to develop a master plan with some assessment from the community um, to see how we're going to actually set some priorities for the allocation of the measure of money. And, and, and again, these are questions, but the community funding grants, you said I think it's 900000 for these core nonprofits. But um, my understanding so far, and this is something we can get to, is that the measure of money is really restricted to parks and that you, it may be some educational things in, like the Sonoma Garden Park or um, you mentioned um, another example. I forget what it is right now. But I, so that's just to make the, the point that I'd like to see us mm -hmm. move before June to have, as if it's possible, I don't know, um, is it possible to have a work study session like the council does to um, just f focus in on where we left off with the, the task force task force recreation and look at the Patero Group's um, findings and recommendations to us. Okay. Well, I am going to need to take that offline and talk with our clerk and with Mr. Berger um, on that. Um, and also, I just I want to just add that, you know, really we also need City Council's direction as well. Um, so I know there's been some discussions about a master plan um, in the future, but I, I think it's been very specific to uh, the downtown and the plaza. So, um, you know, it, it's a bigger discussion, I guess, John, than, mm -hmm. or Commissioner Donnelly, than yeah. just what we can agree to here. Right. Um, really, it needs to match with council's goals and objectives, and because it is a big, big expenditure to do um, a master plan. So I'll just have to circle back to you on that one. Yeah, so it, it still leaves what we do with the measure and money that's tied into parks over the next seven years. And so where where can we play an advisory role to, to the council and to the parks department as to what we think the community's priorities are for that? Yeah, and I think, yeah. you know, immediately following my presentation, Oriana's going to get up and talk about parks. And I know and I don't want to jump into it, but I, I know under Mr. Berger, uh, there has been a park assessment done, and lots of things have, not lots, but there's been projects identified. So I think there's some opportunity there to also address some of the park supervisors' desires to do some things to the parks as well. So. Yeah, and just. Um, Sorry. Sorry. In terms of protocol, um, Chair Donnelly, one of the items that I'll be giving you to make this real easy at the next meeting is this roadmap that the clerk was so gracious to print out for me. And protocol for um, when these items get brought up is when the city staff is finished speaking, one of the first things we'll do is we'll see if there's any um, questions from council members or committee members for staff. And then after we've had any questions for staff, then we'll um, receive public comment. And then public comment will happen both live and Zoom. And then after that, then we'll stop public comment. And that's when we hand the item over to the commission. And on every item, that's how we'll treat it. And so it's, it's a real nice, easy way to get questions to staff public comment and then give the commission everything to digest and take in. Now, um, in response to your question about uh, meetings, we are going to have a, an upcoming item to discuss that. Yeah. So are there any more questions for staff on this item from the commission? Um, yeah, um, I may have missed it, but I, uh, your list was very comprehensive. But I, I didn't see the Montini Trail or the Overlook Trail. All the open spaces. Okay. I realize that. Okay. Yes. And then the other question I have is, how does the overlap work with uh, county 
and uh, state. Like for instance, the bike path goes through the state park. Um, and yeah. I'm looking at Mr. Berger over here. Um, that would be a question I have for, that would have to go to you. Um, in terms of just the bike path, the, the city has an easement for the bike path, so we own the property right along that, and we maintain it, and where it passes yeah. through the state property as well. Any more questions for staff on this item? Um, just just a, a follow-up for the catalyst for the $40,000 grant, just how that money was spent, where did it go, what was the outcome, um, the report and any follow-up or leftover funds from that? So um, the Catalyst money went directly to the Boys and Girls Club, and they actually paid Potrero for the research. And so the city kind of stayed out of the transaction that way. Um, all of the funds were used to produce the benchmark assessment that um, we'll bring back to you. And so the Boys and Girls Club has the assessment? Uh, it, the city received a copy of the report, recently um, but again I haven't had any I haven't had any dialogue with Potrero group since probably uh, summer of last year so uh, before I comment on it I just want to be able to hear from them I haven't received the report myself so um, we will get that to you and I think we're all going to um, I've seen the report but I don't haven't had the report delivered with any other feedback from them so you'll get it can I ask one thing? Um, we have like a, a basketball hoop that ha is, hasn't been fixed in a long time, like at the local park. And I was just wondering, like, is it, because it would cost more than like $300, so the, like a group of me and my friends put some money into it, would that be okay to get it, get it, get it fixed if everybody's cool with it? The city probably has budget for that, and we could probably take care of it. Right. We could talk offline and find out the location. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yes. Any other questions for staff? Anything on Zoom? No. Uh, yeah. We're going to open public comment in one second. Let me move yeah, over there. Thank you. And if there's any public comment of anybody here tonight, Please step up to the microphone and state your name. Hi, uh, Matt Metzler again. I just had a couple of uh, comments about my, wanted to, just to share with the commissioners my experience on the Community Services Environment Commission. Uh, Commissioner Tolbert asked about uh, other uh, places within the city that are not actually in the city's jurisdiction. And everybody needs to be aware of that includes the, the schools are not, are, you know, basically not subject to city uh, regulations also includes the state park also it includes the vets building because the vets building is a county facility and it is even though it's located within in the city limits and this is an issue that came up with the commission uh, back when we were trying to when we uh, passed regulation banning um, styrofoam containers at public events and uh, at the at big events like on the plaza and the we could not enforce that at the uh, vets building because it's actually a county property not a city property anyway i just wanted to uh share with you guys that you are so lucky to have lisa on your side and doing she just does an outstanding job with us overseeing those those special events and i wanted to make a comment about the work plan phase two uh a couple of years before the pandemic the the community services environment commission did a lot of work and the city staff and the former public works director fergie did a lot of work on uh one of our initiatives was uh identified for us by the uh Eris weaver the director of the sonoma county bicycle coalition who came to the city and said when i rode my bike around town it's we have some nice bike paths, but there's a real lack of bike parking on the plaza. And so uh, a proposal was made and the funding was available for bike parking. Uh, however, the city council turned it down because the proposal included a paved um, 
pad on which the racks would be uh, installed. So, uh, you know, I think it, it'd be fine to have, in my personal opinion as a bicyclist, it'd be fine to park bikes on uh, gravel, uh, wood chips, or whatever. But uh, anyway, the the city council, we have feedback from the public, many people, uh, who some of whom objected to paving part of the plaza. You know, I got an email from someone saying not one inch of the plaza should be paved. So those are some of the issues that you guys are going to have to uh, think about addressing in the future. But I would really like to see if we could move forward with the bicycle parking on the plaza that was that we did a lot of work on. It was at least three or four years ago now, um, and I'd like to see if the, if you guys could help make sure that make that move forward. Thank you. Any other public comment from someone here tonight on the current item? Rebecca, do we have any comment on Zoom? No, we do not. And with that, I'll go ahead and assist the chair and close public comment. And at this point, we open it up to commission discussion. And so if there's any further discussion that you want to do based on what you've heard, um, now would be the time. Is there anybody else would like to add a point or question? Um, I don't think we have a vote on this, do we? I mean, it's just uh, information. So thank you, Lisa. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. That presentation was spot on. It tells a story. And um, like she said at the start, we, we've missed having a commission to address things like this. And we're ready to go. And with that, uh, we'll go to our next item, which is a presentation by Oriana Hart on Parks and Open Space Overview. All right, thank you. While they're getting it up, I just wanted to say this is going to be a, just a brief primer of our Parks and Open Space program. I assume that most of you folks knew a lot about our parks wanting to be on this commission, but it gives us a good like starting place of where we are, both in our operational budgets and some of the projects that we're working on right now and, and how that process goes about. Um, so I'll just launch in, they'll, they'll have to catch up with me. So the city parks are vital to maintaining the quality of life in Sonoma. Public works park staff maintain our parks on an operational budget of $1.3 million annually. That was for fiscal year 22-23. With that budget, staff serves the needs of Sonoma citizens by maintaining, operating, and improving the parks and trails, as well as supporting special events. Parks needs that exceed the capacity of the city staff and contracts that are large for large public improvements are included in the capital improvement program for our parks department. The park CIP budget for this fiscal year was $952,000. Um, and in addition to apportionments from the general fund, our CIP budget is funded by Measure M, which is the one eighth sales tax that you mentioned. And I'll pause there and say that those projects will come to you. So we have put forth what we want to spend our money on from the last two or three fiscal years at the Measure M board, but we'll be presenting what we want to spend next fiscal years on. I think their meeting is in June. So at your next quarterly meeting, if not before, we'll present what Public Works would like to spend that money on, and we can all discuss it together. And the other pots of monies that we have for our CIP budget are Prop 68, which allocates funds to construct and rehabilitate parks and park and loo fees that are imposed on developers for housing projects. Um, the Prop 68 funds um, was a one-time grant from the state, and we had to apply for it back at the oh, 21, December in 21, and the city chose to use that money for the plaza and primarily to fund replacement of the waste receptacles and upgrade them to wrapping recycling cans and composting. Um, some of the fun or the pricing that we got for that was way less than what we had when we originally did the proposal. So one of the things that we're going to bring to you guys um, soon, hopefully, is uh, not only to look at the decisions about what kind of waste receptacles we should be putting on the plaza, but what other things we could spend the rest of that money on, because we have uh, almost $100,000 in excess of money that we have to spend this year on improvements to Plaza Park. So that'll be coming your way soon. 
Parks Maintenance staff maintains the city's parks, including 11 neighborhood parks. Uh, staff has been working on a needs assessment report, which will provide recommendations for strategic investment in rehabilitating parks in the city. The draft report indicates uh, a needed investment in infrastructure uh, upgrades, such as replacement of playground substrates, improved lighting, refurbishment and replacement signs, safety bollards, and water filling stations. Um, one of the improvements, which will be coming to the pros this year um, and was a recommendation for last year's Measure M funding um, was a con um, renovation of the Olson Neighborhood Park, um, including potential replacement of the playground surface, the improvement of the picnic area, including, including an accessible surface and shade structure, removing some shrubs that are inhibiting kind of line of sight and safety issues around the playground, and replacing some of the um, non-functional turf areas with low maintenance cover and potentially uh, expanding the exercise equipment along the bike path to kind of um, improve that facility. A community engagement process to discuss what the neighborhood would like to see in that park will be kicking off this spring. And the parks maintenance staff is also um, responsible for the upkeep of nine playgrounds, as well as their associated picnic and barbecue areas. The playground equipment is well maintained with quarterly safety assessments conducted. The most recent safety assessment took place in February and identified no safety hazards. Um, Public Works also collaborates with citizens to gather input and vision for playgrounds in our parks. And a proposal for a new playground structure at Sonoma Oaks, located off Fifth Street West, may be presented to this committee by a local neighborhood group at some point in our future. Parks maintenance staff is entrusted with the upkeep of the flagship Plaza Park, which covers an approximately eight acres and situated in the heart of the city. Um, the park features a variety of specialty amenities, including water fountains, a rose garden, duck ponds, and the outdoor amphitheater for performing arts. As Lisa discussed, it hosts numerous events throughout the year, such as the concerts and farmers markets, and the park is an important gathering place, a symbol of the community's commitment to preserving Sonoma's history. One of the prior city council's priorities was to complete a plaza master plan. And as Lisa was talking about, um, we would imagine that part of that would happen here in the pros committee. Uh, the city of Sonoma it has another historical park depot, which is named after the historical Sonoma Valley train depot um, that was located on that site. Um, this park also hosts a variety of community events throughout the year and public works has three active CIP projects at depot park which will be underway this year. The, the upgrade of the museum's HVAC system, rehabilitation of the pedestrian pathway, increasing ADA accessibility, and upgrading the landscape to provide low impact development plantings, as well as rehabilitating the depot restroom. The City of Sonoma uh, offers and maintains several bike trails as well, connecting the city and primarily the Sonoma Bike Path, which is the 3.4 mile paved path through the city. We have a master plan that was last updated in 2014 and developed, was developed to guide a safe and interconnected bikeway system throughout the city. The plan was created through extensive community engagement and input from a wide range of stakeholders. Since the adoption of the master plan, the city has made significant progress in implementing its recommendations, adding a new bike lanes, improving signage, and recently with the completion of the Friar Creek pedestrian and bike bridge that connected neighborhoods. In the years to come, Public Works hopes to upgrade this master plan and develop new programs to promote biking and active transportation. Additionally, Public Works runs an Adopt-a-Bike Path program that allows the community members to help maintain and enhance the bike paths in the city. The program is open to individuals, groups, and businesses who want to take an active role in keeping the bike path safe and enjoyable for everybody. Participants in the program are responsible for a specific section of the bike path and are required to perform basic maintenance tasks such as litter pickup and weeding. Uh, Public Works will be rolling out some changes to the signage and policy around this program and we will present those here as well. 
Uh, we also have some na natural spaces tucked away in our neighborhoods. Uh, the Nathanson's, Nathanson Preserve is a demonstration garden with native plants on MacArthur Street and 2nd Street East. It was developed with the assistance of the Sonoma Ecology Center and Ag and Open Space to rehabilitate and restore the banks of Nathanson Creek. Um, it offers educational opportunities to users of the park as well as habitat for native pollinators. Uh, across MacArthur Street to the north end of the preserve, the Oxbow Park helps maintain the overflow flooding while providing valuable habitat. And Sonoma Garden Park, which we mentioned, was created in 1993, a six-acre community agricultural park owned by the City of Sonoma and operated by the Ecology Center with ongoing support of numerous volunteers and partner organizations. The park offers uh, winding paths and beautiful park-like setting. And we have St. Francis Wetland Preserve, otherwise known as St. Francis Place, which was created as a mitigation site through a development agreement in 1984 to preserve the 4.5 acres of vernal pool habitat to create additional habitat. The site was determined, or determined to be a mitigation failure within two years, uh, and efforts to protect and manage the site were ultimately forgotten until around uh, last year. And we are taking the initial steps to understand water and plants and character and doing water depth and floristic studies this year to see if it has the potential to be a viable vernal pool site or if not a potential wetland habitat. And finally, we have our open space. The Montini Open Space Preserve, a 98-acre park just north of the city of Sonoma, acquired in 2005 to protect the area's nature, natural beauty. The preserve boasts a network of scenic hiking trails and offers breathtaking views of the surrounding hills and valley. Uh, in addition, the park is the home to a variety of sensitive habitats, including oak woodland and wetlands, and uh, supports a diverse range of flora and fauna. The Montini Open Space Preserve is primarily maintained by the Sonoma Ecology Center staff and volunteers. We have two capital improvement projects that are scheduled to launch in March and April of this year at the Montini Open Space. The first involves building a trail to connect a section of the existing Valley of the Moon Trail, which currently ends at two go point with the rest of the trail via an uh, existing fire road. And the second project aims to improve and create flat land kiosks for increased accessibility. And on the other side of Norbaum, we have the Sonoma Overlook Trail, which is a three-mile hiking trail that offers panoramic views of the valley. And although the trail is steep in sections, uh, most hikers can get to it all the way up to the top. Uh, the Sonoma Overlook Trail Stewarts, a nonprofit organization founded in 1995, primarily maintained the trail in partnership with the City of Sonoma. Uh, the group organizes regular trail maintenance and days to clear brush, repair erosion, and maintain the trail's infrastructure. And Public Works will continue to work with the stewards in the upcoming maintenance projects for both the Overlook Trail and the Martini Open Space. You can stay tuned for more updates on that. And that's all I have. I'm happy to answer questions. At this point, does the Commission have any questions for staff? I have a comment. <clears throat> Something that I'm interested in is, especially in regards to open space areas, I'm always interested in knowing how protected those areas are in perpetuity. So maybe going forward, if that could be included in the information that we get, that might be helpful. Uh, agreed, and I think you need to help me find it because I know what me document you're talking about, and it would be good to discuss in this forum. <laughs> Thank you, Oriana. Um, when I moved here in 1998, the first two public events I got in, we became engaged in was one to get the chickens off the plaza, and the second was the Rosewood Hotel that was supposed to go on Shocken Hill where the Overlook Trail was built. So we're about to have our 20th anniversary celebration is April 11th or 17th? 16th. 16th, Sunday. And um, we're trying to put our story together, how this all came about. And I don't, if this is too much of, to ask, say so, but it would be really helpful if you could tell us, the stewards, how much over these 20 years the city has put in of its taxpayers' money because my, our impression is that while there's been some contribution, an overwhelming amount has come from volunteer fundraising and the volunteer hours that went into 
making a trail possible and sustained. So if you if you had that, or even a rough guess, that would be helpful when we put our sell our 20th anniversary story together. Uh, yeah, I, I can absolutely help you. I'd want to work with you to figure out what projects happened before the ones that I know about, which yeah. were only the most recent ones in the last five years. But that's that, that those me. are the ones, yeah, you know, the grants and mm -hmm. so forth. Yeah. Yeah. If Thank you me. have ones before that, yeah. spanning back the previous 15 years, I could probably yeah. at least come up with a good guess. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? My question relates to the bike path and. Um, you know, I use the bike path quite a bit, and with the proliferation of e-bikes, uh, I see a sign or two saying that motorized uh, vehicles aren't permitted, but I'm seeing a lot of um, motorized skateboards and bicycles that just go way too fast, and I just am wondering what the solution to that might be. How, do, how would we enforce no motorized vehicles on on the bike path. I defer to you, Mike. <laughs> no, that's a great point. It's turning into um, a little different dynamic with the battery-powered bicycles. And I'm not aware of how the signage addresses the incorporation of those new vehicles onto the onto the trail. So something for staff to look into. I I I have a. Oh, is there somebody saying something? Go right ahead. Oh. I I was also saying too. It says no dogs allowed at the park. Everybody walks their dog in the park. Like, shouldn't they take that sign now? It's kind of ridiculous. As long as you keep them on a leash. I think dogs are allowed on the perimeter of the plaza and I have seen dogs inside the plaza on the perimeter also but I believe dogs are allowed on the perimeter you just don't want yeah I get it like you don't want to bring them around like young kids because your dog could be crazy or something oh, okay that makes a little sense is it not the case that dogs are prohibitive in all city parks I believe they're allowed on the perimeter of the plaza okay I mean other than the perimeter of the plaza. We have a couple of parks that allow dogs. There are a couple of them, and I can't name them off the top of my head. But I know we have two that do allow them. Hartenstein Park allows dogs. You have to have them on leash, and I can't remember what else. But substantially, yes. <laughs> Any other questions for staff on this item? Um, maintenance of the parks, um, Oriana. You mentioned. $1.3 million a year and then $952,000 for the capital improvement budget. And then I missed Prop 68, which addressed, or that money was to address the trash receptacles. Where did that net out, not from a dollar perspective, but where did that net out on like why there aren't new trash receptacles or are there, or did I miss that part? I um, we brought a proposal to council, or the previous council, and they didn't like them. So we're going to bring another proposal to you guys for your opinions, and then hopefully we'll find ones that this current council can accept. And you said that the budget, the, the amount of money you had from Prop 68 towards those receptacles, you actually came in quite below that in terms of what you proposed. Yeah, they, they were, just didn't the like the budget, style. They didn't like the style. So the budget amount was $250,000 for them. Okay. Um, and the grant in, in its total with our match is two forty. Um, and the But ones that we proposed would have been $120,000. Um, so the council has put forth the desire to maybe have a smaller container. So the options that we're going to present here may even be less than that, in which case we have quite a bit of money in that grant that we can use for other. It can't be used for maintenance. It has to be used for upgrades. Bike racks, things. for bike, example. Bike racks, for example, yes. OK. Um, great. Let's get that on the agenda. You know, might as well move it forward. <laughs> it's sitting there. I have one other question that might be relevant here. Um, as far as the measure of money that goes to parks, um, is Karen Graves the current District 1 uh, member of the 
Citizens Oversight Committee that reports from all nine Sonoma cities to the county that we're managing the measure of money in the spirit of the of the. She was past. last year, I yeah. believe, that she retired, and I don't think they filled the seat. They so, is that an appointment by Susan Gorn, or does the city have a say in that? I don't know how that works. So, Rebecca says the city. <laughs> I'm sorry, are you saying the city can yeah. make an appointment if it's a vacant position? It's not one of the city's appointments. It no. is, um, I'd have to go back and look at it. I'm sorry, I've gone through so many commissions just recently. Yeah. Um, but there is, I believe, and I, I believe they were, um, they were restructuring that advisory committee, and that's why I don't really have a good answer for you, so mm. I'd have to do a little bit more research on where that's mm. at now. But, so my understanding at this point is that all nine cities report to the Citizens Oversight Committee at least once a year, and they go through the expenditures and so forth. And so it would be really important for this, the Pros Commission, to be in some kind of uh, collaboration with whoever are are we District One? I think that, um, so that we know who that is and we can um, be part of the reporting process that goes to the Oversight Committee. Is that? Is that a fair way of looking at it? Yes, that would be very helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, one other thing you touched on, I'm sorry, I wrote it down and I forgot to mention. Um, maintenance of the parks in relation to safety of the playgrounds. Um, I'd like to double click on that a little bit in terms of the quarterly safety. Um, I have a two-year-old and a one-year-old and I have, can guarantee you I've been to every playground in this town more than once um, and so have many of you know my peers. Um, there are many safety issues in my opinion uh, with a lot including the especially in the plaza as far as um, sand. Mike we talked about this a little bit being replenished at the base of the slides, the surfaces being uneven between, um, you know, the, the sort of permanent, it's not cement, what Ron would know the, the right term for it, versus sand, and, um, and the picnic areas. I, I would really like to address that further at a future, on a future agenda item as far as, um, you know, what of the budget could be used towards, because I, I think the, the playgrounds are great, like there's nothing wrong with them they can easily be updated with a very small amount of the budget but the the safety issues are definitely you know there's some very steep slides in sonoma um at a few of the parks that i'm shocked have made it through a quarterly safety um inspection whatever that means to this to the county thanks I, I wouldn't speak for our park supervisor and exactly what he's looking for, but I think he's looking less at the design and more at like if there's sharps coming out of the bolts or if there are cracks or anything to that effect. But one of the things we definitely identified when we did our needs assessment was the, the substrates for all of the parks, like sand just across the board is not great for playgrounds, so we would love to do a capital improvement project globally to replace that at all the park playgrounds. Yeah, and some really spiky plantation around the pathways on the parks. You know, my toddler almost lost an eye on one of the sharp cactuses that stick out right near where they ride their bikes around on the pavement. So anyhow, we can address all those details later. Thanks. Any other questions or I guess we can go to public comment then. Are there any? Yes, Matt. Hi, I wanted to, I was looking up at the uh, list of city parks and I wanted to draw uh, the staff and the commission's attention to uh, the new, probably the newest city park, and I'm not even sure if this is a city park, but on the, in the uh, southeast corner of town, uh, uh, between um, west of Fifth Street East and north of um, Napa Road, you know, there's new housing develop newer housing development. They've been there quite a few years. I kind of live in that part of town and ride my bicycle around there a lot. And there's a little city park there. And I'm not sure if everybody is aware of this, but it is a city. I assume it's a city park. And I assume it was it was required. The city re mandated the developer build the park when they develop the homes in that area, which is great. Uh, but it is a city park that has no playground and no picnic tables. 
And why is that? How did that ever come to be? It's the park that's uh, bordered on the east and west by Pierce Drive and Ingram Drive, and north and south by, S by Saunders Drive and Ingler Street. I don't know the name of the park, but it's in the... Uh, yeah. Sonoma Valley Oaks. Yeah, Sonoma Valley. Uh, how did the city of Sonoma ever approve a city park that doesn't, it has benches, but it does ha not have a single picnic table? And there is no play structure or playground or, it, you know, it's nice grass and landscaping. So anyway, I just think it'd be great if with some of those m funds could be used to put a, a you know, the, the all, play, all parks should have playgrounds and should have, you know, play, uh, picnic benches. You can't, there's there are, uh, picnic tables. There's benches, but you can't, people who live in the neighborhood cannot go across the street from their park and have a picnic with their family and friends. It seems very strange to me, and I don't know how that happened. So anyway, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Hopefully you can be addressed with um, allocating those funds in the future. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Lori Sebesta, and I'm the current chair of Bocce Sonoma. Um, obviously, we have a bit of a reputation or, or representation here this evening and last um, we'd probably have a reputation too by now but um, <laughs> I presented last week to the City Council and um, we have several items that we are concerned about Mike's aware of some of them um, I'm almost feeling like I have a population of almost 600 people playing bocce that doesn't include Patonk Together, we're about 750. So we operate independently in Depot Park. And I'm feeling that Depot Park is a stepchild. Um, the plaza gets a lot of attention, obviously. But one of our major concerns is the bathrooms. And I have to tell you that our population runs from 60 to 90 in age. Um, and the bathrooms, I don't know if any of you have seen my letter, but it went to the Sun and perhaps to the IT as well. But for a city of our caliber, our bathrooms are an absolute disgrace. And if we have an abundance or an excess of money, I think this commission should absolutely put money toward the bathroom, uh, bathrooms, obviously, both the park and the I think our smaller parks don't have bathrooms, so um, this this is critical. Uh, we're we're a town of stature, and it's an absolute embarrassment. End of my comment. Hi, I, I hope I'm not on line coming up here again, but I wanted to respond to Commissioner Tolbert's comments about the bike path, which is, um, I'm an avid bicyclist, have been for 45 years, and a member of the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition, and uh, the situation with e-bikes is kind of the wild west out there. I've done some research, I've read a lot. In Europe, it's very strictly regulated, and only class one e-bikes are allowed on bike paths. Class 1 e-bikes are bikes that are limited to no more than 18 miles an hour and will own the electric motor only will operate while pedaling. That's pedal assist. And those are you know very are are are, are no faster than an a ordinary bicyclist who's who's in really good shape of riding really fast. However, they, we have this proliferation of class 2 and class 3 uh, e-bikes, class 3 e-bikes are basically glorified electrified motorcycles. They see, I see them going by in, in, my, in my neighborhood and on the bike paths, not paying attention to um, traffic signs and regulations and not pedaling, you know. To me, if it's an e-bike, so anyway, it's very unfortunate that in this country we do not have consistent statewide or nationwide regulation of e-bikes and that's what we, what we would need because it's crazy to see these people who I think who are riding what riding like they would be riding a motorcycle they would be cited if they were, were riding an actual motorcycle on a bike path and yet because it's electric they're getting away with it so 
that's another huge issue to deal with. One of the sol solutions I would suggest, I would really recommend, is that the bike path between uh, Second Street East and the Vallejo home should be double pa double laned. There should be two separate lanes. One is a bike path with a uh, stripe down the middle with two directions of travel, and the other is a pedestrian only path, clearly signed. And, but that would be a huge lift to you know acquire that property and everything. But I think that is one solution is we need to separate because really most of our bike paths are mostly dog walking and pedestrians, and it's not uh, you know in that stretch near the plaza it's it's not faster to go to bicycle on the bike path because there's so many, on, on, especially on busy weekends, there's so many pedestrians. So it, it would be nice to have a separate bike and pedestrian path in that busy section. Thank you. Good evening. I'm, I'm Ron Wallander. You're um, a resident of Sonoma for many years, and I'm actually wearing several hats as I come up to speak. I wasn't sure if I missed my opportunity earlier or if this was going to be my only chance to come up. So first and foremost, I want to thank each of you for your willingness to serve on this commission. I think it's very important. I also want to let you know that I have, some might say I drew the short straw. I'm actually the, your liaison between your commission and the council. And I just want to uh, reiterate that uh, I am accessible. Please reach out to me with any comments or concerns. Uh, my goal is to support you, and um, I'll, I look forward to working with you. Now, do I have anything germane to the actual agenda item? Um, thank you for all your work in uh, continuing to keep keep in continuing to keep open space a priority. I am excited about the spaces that we have. I w want to encourage all of us to uh, maintain them at a quality that we can be proud of. And um, <clears throat> I think my three minutes are up, so. Are there any other comments from the patient public? I just uh, will add, I totally uh, agree with your comment about the state of restrooms in the city of Sonoma, public parks. It's just, we've had that problem at the Overlook Trail for years. Uh, there's no access at all, and same for the Montini Trail. It's something I want to encourage you to see in Maxwell Park, some new bathrooms being built there. But I would certainly, and if you go on the directory of our record. In fact, I, I made this point with Karen Collins and Steve Page. They need to put bathrooms as a specific category in that inventory so people know where they can find one. Um, but uh, all bottom lines, I think Measure M, capital improvements money, that w that's something where we're listening to the public and we hear you and I think we can hopefully move forward with that. I was invited on a potty tour a few months back with some of the current members of City Council and I brought my one-year-old, well he was six months at the time, in a stroller to illustrate um, how difficult it is to get in and out with those heavy metal doors and also there's no changing table. Um, and I, as, you, as I've mentioned, I have two under two so I have a double stroller. I left my children with a perfect stranger outside who looked very lovely and kind so that I could go to the restroom myself and kept them in the so just to echo John's point I'm I'm uh, I'm on <laughs> yeah it's it's a big issue and it's embarrassing because people come to our town you know for the weekend and what have you and have this charming place to visit and wine taste and enjoy and and that's our representation of how we care about the parks and I think you know, it needs to be addressed. It's long overdue. Those cobwebs are gross. It smells disgusting. You know, all of the above. So, thank you for your comment. I think that's it for this agenda item. Great. Sounds good. Well, we're going to go to Zoom and we're going to see if we have any public comment on Zoom. And there isn't any. And then just, um, in general, uh, I understand tonight's our inaugural meeting and we're all learning the ins and outs. Typically, the commission, it's, it can turn into a little bit of a free-for-all if the commission interacts. 
with people that are doing public comment. And so it's best to just listen to public comment, understand, take notes. And then at the end, if you have any questions for staff, you can have you can go ahead and ask those questions to staff or any direction towards staff. And then at this point, and um, because it's our inaugural meeting, we're gonna give Mr. Metzler a hall pass because every citizen only gets one time in three minutes, and those are the rules. But tonight, he gets a hall pass, okay. yep. So uh, at this point, it's up for discussion with the commission on this item. And if the commission, we've already had a little bit of discussion, but if the commission wants to do any more discussion, further discussion on this item, they can. Uh, so I've lived here since 1991, I live on Broadway, I walk most places, and I'm involved with the Overlook Trail, I use a lot of the recreation areas, um, and what I have observed is, and I think this will be obvious to everyone here, is that we don't have enough money in our police department to enforce regulations. I mean, the police basically are using their time for criminal activity and the like, from what I see, enforcing those rules. But I just wonder if we can keep that in mind when we make decisions and make plans, the enforceability of, of all of these regu regulations, and make maybe even, you know, I'm actually chair of the Snow Overlook Trail, and we make the assumption that we are not backed up by the police to enforce our regulations, so we just do the best we can. So to me, that's an issue. No comment on Zoom? Okay. Yeah, that we, we should have closed public comment a couple of minutes ago, and I forgot to do that. I apologize. Yeah. So public comment's closed. Is there any further discussion by the commission on this item? I don't think see, see or hear any. Okay, well, with that, Oriana, thank you for that report, and we will go ahead and move on to the next agenda item. And I'm... Sure, Donnelly, I'm just going to continue doing this. Um, next meeting, you can go ahead and do it, but I'll uh, just jump right in. You're my, item. You're my coach. I'm still moving down the learning curve. Thank item you. Item 4.5, thank you. And this is uh, Plaza Depot Park AEDs. And I'm presenting this item tonight to the commission. As part of the agenda item summary, uh, city staff has been working, the Sonoma Fire Department has been a lead department on acquiring two automated external defibrillators, AEDs, for use in the city of Sonoma public spaces. These devices are a medical device designed to analyze the heart rhythm, deliver an electric shock to victims of cardiac arrest, and restore the heart rhythm to normal. To normal. Based on a variety of factors including necessary electrical infrastructure to support the device, location visibility, accessibility, and serving the public space users, Public Works has developed the recommended locations for AED devices at the plaza and depot park. I, I honestly think that's a great idea. Thank you. So I've seen some people um, have cardiac arrest and they, they can't get to them in time. They need to be like around schools and, and places like that. Thank you. These approximate layout locations are shown on the following attachments for both the plaza and depot park. This, this uh, aerial view, this I'm seeing two. Okay, is that, yeah, that's depot, right? Do you want me to go back to the no, depot is fine, we'll start there. This is depot park and it's not easy to pick these locations. Um, we have collaborated with Bachi and Patong. We've taken input from different people in the community. What we're trying to get is a high use, highly visible location that has a adequate power source to power the unit. And, and that's gonna ease our ability to install. So, with collaboration between Public Works and the Fire Department, we're recommending that the AED unit gets put as a wall mount unit just west of the Patonk Courts, 
and within clear sight of the bike trail at Depot Park and the um, main restroom at Depot Park. That's the famous restroom. And it's visible from the bike path. So uh, in, in the ease of installation on this is that uh, this is one of our facilities that Patonk shares as their storage closet. And we have a circuit in this unit capable of providing power to the wall mount unit. Public Works and the Fire Department have agreed that this, this would be one of the best spots to put this at this time in order to, and what we want to do here too is we want to facilitate uh, ease of construction on this and being able to get it in as fast as possible. And because there's a lot of different opinions on this, we wanted to bring it to the pros and see what see what the opinion was. Um, Bocce is here tonight, and if they want to weigh in on the location also, um, that's that's a possibility. The second location, and this is the one that we, the one at Depot Park, and you can stay where you are, Kath. The one at Depot Park, uh, that one, it's, it's a little bit more, um, ease of use to put it in and it's easier to make a recommendation. The one at the plaza, if you don't want to make a recommendation on that tonight, I, I totally um, am good with that. The, as we know, the historical plaza, there's a lot of different people that have a lot of different opinions on everything that happens there. And this unit, uh, it doesn't look historic. It's not designed to. It is designed to stick out and as when we walked with the fire department and tried to f come with, up with the best location that we could, it's right there in the roundabout as you go in on the right, just before you get to city hall. And then we've got the close up for it in the, um, in the uh, little portion on the upper right hand corner. If, if the commission chose to chew on this one and think about it for a while and uh, digest it, that would be fine. But we're not ready to put it in yet anyway, and it's gonna take an electrical modification. So it's gonna it's gonna take a little bit more time to put it in. So we could take that up at a at a, one of our next meetings, which we'll talk about as the next agenda item. And with that, uh, that concludes my presentation. And does the commission have any questions? Yeah. Um, two quick questions. One is, it looks like it's maybe, oops, it's gone. Oh, sorry. Um, it looks like it's about four feet tall. Yeah, about. Okay. Um, I think it's a fantastic idea. Maybe a little taller. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, pretty hard to say no to. What I'm wondering is, is there going to be any other signage around the plaza to notify people that it's there? Or is it just one of these things where you just people get used to knowing that it's there? Currently, we don't have any plans for more signage, but that's a possibility. And we've already talked about a little bit more signage up at Depot Park, just because if you are riding by fast on a bicycle, you might not know where it is, especially if you haven't been to that area before. And so having a couple of signs that basically you are here and that's where the AED is. Yeah, so we have talked about that, but um, we haven't discussed it yet at the plaza. The Depot Park one is at the forefront. Mike, what um, other locations were considered by you and the fire department, public works and the fire department um, for both of these? Like what were the top two considerations other than these locations? I'm just curious, particularly the one at Depot. At Depot, we looked at three at Depot. No other facilities were looked at, but at Depot, we looked at three locations and we looked at the main bathroom, mm -hmm. which we were having open discussion with Bocce and Patonk, and Bocce and Patonk paid a portion of the AED, and they, they donated money for the purchase of it. And so they were uh, stakeholders in the project. We had, and they were, you know, they were one of the ones instrumental in developing Depot as a location. So what we wanted to do was, we wanted to make it an, in a high use area. Up at the, at the start, we were talking about the bathroom. And at the bathroom, there isn't really gathering of people. And then it's it started morphing and other people said, well, why not in the parking lot at Arnold Field? And then it was like, wait a minute, let's reel this back in because Arnold Field should really have its own unit. 
-hmm. Yeah, and so we're not trying to put it somewhere where a lot of different places could potentially use it. And so then as we talked with Bocce and Patonk and we, we toured the facility with fire department, we were gonna try putting it on the uh, bike trail just south of the bathroom and we don't have the electrical infrastructure there to make that happen. We have lights along the path, but none of those circuits can be used to power the unit. So then that's when we talked to Bachi and Patonk and came up with the, uh, the location that we came up with as, it's very close to the Patonk courts, it's very visible from the Bachi courts, and you can see it from the bathroom, and you can see it from the path. So okay. that was kind of the genesis of how we ended up with that. I'm not familiar with this location. I'd rather just, I think, personally go see. I, I totally understand the argument. As long as, to me, it doesn't naturally feel like people on the bike path would necessarily look there, but maybe I'm wrong. I, I'd love pu public comment on this just to understand a little bit better. But, um, but I totally, what's the cost implication of putting it closer to the bike like if you were going to have to build an electrical circuit it's like a dramatically incremental cost I imagine to do a freestanding unit it's not dramatic it just takes more time and it takes more effort okay. yeah it's not a dramatic cost it is work we have to get an electrician to do it and um, and you know here again the bocce court and the baton courts that's it, a depot park has a lot of visitors in it, mm -hmm. but the bocce and the Patan courts have visitors more often. And so with this location, we thought that that would be um, easily accessible. And realistically, uh, you know, we, we could um, public, this, this location is, and Kathy, could you pull that up again? Just so that you're familiar with this, the bocce and the patonk courts are right there underneath the box on the arrow and then you've got the um, Casa Grande parking lot at the bottom of the photo there and then up if you travel all the way to the west of the patonk court that's where this little pump station building is and you can even see the patonk courts there and you can see the depot museum in the upper right hand corner where the unit is displayed. So the depot museum is right there. So I have a great. Are you talking about like uh, when you say depot park? Is, that's the one that's like right next to where the lovely field is. Yes, Arnold yeah. Field. That one. Arnold Field. Oh, okay, gotcha. yeah. A um, couple questions. Does does the city have any history of cardiac arrest? I mean, where have they most likely occurred? Is it been the plaza depot park I, the other thing is it's nice that this might be a viewed for, or advertised through the vintage house and, and else they have their own uh, system well a lot of these a lot of these units we have one out at our office a lot of these units can be put right on the side of a wall on the interior of a building mm -hmm. and I, I would imagine that vintage house has one inside their facility mm -hmm. yeah and there is there is history with this uh, the high school within the last six months to a year and this was a kickoff that the fire department got involved in when when the young man that was playing on the basketball courts actually had a cardiac arrest a high schooler and he was resuscitated by his friends and they actually came to a council meeting one night and were recognized and that unit is was was installed at the high school on the basketball courts and I've never seen it, but I've heard enough stories. I'm positive it's there. Yeah, so there is a history, and there's a um, the fire department's involved in the the um, movement that happened as a result of that to to get some funding and get these uh, these units installed and, and secure them. Is there any concern about vandalism and what's other places have had these? Are they in public places like this? Yeah, there's always that concern. And my understanding is that when you take the, when you open it up, it makes some serious noise. Yeah, and so that would hopefully deter people. If they did it once, they wouldn't do it a second time, hopefully. Any public comment? 
Yes. Hello, my name is Jeanette Sharik. I am a almost 50 year resident of Sonoma. I've worked in healthcare and hospitals for almost 25 years, including Sonoma Valley Hospital, and I've seen a lot of people die. And I uh, wanted to get a tower, an AED tower, not the portables, but a tower uh, that would be accessible to the seniors who play bocce Sonoma seven days a week and to the Patonk players who are also there just about the same amount of time. So I worked with uh, Steve Aker, who is our fire chief, and we talked about how to make that happen. So he uh, was able to get a donation from the Just One Mike organization, which is the organization that resulted from the death of the, their son who did not get CPR care. Uh, they were also donating their a tower at the high school, which is why our resident high schooler was saved. Uh, so anyway, Steve and I have worked together. I worked also with uh, Ryan McCracken, who is one of the first responders here in Sonoma. And they got a donation from the Sonoma Valley Volunteer Fire Department, uh, just one mic and I was able to secure donations from Bachi Sonoma and the Valley of the Moon Patonk to purchase this tower. So we wanted it close so that if someone did fall and drop, need CPR in, in, immediately, that somebody, most likely a senior, could access the AED without having another heart attack. So not running a great distance to get the CPR or the uh, AED uh, equipment. So we were looking at the light tower right off the depot uh, or the uh, bike path lane, and that seemed to be ideal, but apparently there is a complication with the electrical connection and the cost related to that. We uh, have paid for the, the tower, so maybe it, uh, not knowing what the cost would be, maybe it would be affordable from the city to do that. There are lots of portables in the uh, town of Sonoma. I have come to learn they're just not publicized as to where they are. So the tower is visible. It would be accessible to almost 800 seniors. Uh, and we'd like to see it before our season starts, which is March 25th. So thank you. If I can add on to that, um, you know, like they say, money never bought a moment of time. I don't really think it's about the money. I think it's about caring about people, just being a human being. So I understand where you're coming from. And even though I'm an alternate, if I happen to make it on one day, I'll, I'll make sure that everything I do is going to help people in this community and even outside of the community. I really appreciate that statement. Thank you. Uh, two quick comments. Again, first, as a city councilman, I'd like to thank staff for elevating this uh, project up. Um, it was brought to our attention in our last city council meeting by very enthusiastic bocce ball players and petanque players, so thank you for elevating it up and addressing it this evening. Uh, I take off my city council hat. I'm putting on my landscape architect's hat. I've been a real strong proponent in the last five, six plus years to this concept of uh, a master plan for the plaza. But I really think that the location of the uh, uh, device that is proposed um, may not be ideal, but at the same time, we don't have a pure plaza that has met and checked all the aesthetic perfect boxes. So I'd be inclined to support what is being proposed by the city, recognizing that when we do get to that very exciting master plan phase where we can really look at things in a much more uh, a broader way, that if we have to put some lipstick on the, quote, pig, then we might be able to do it, or we may have a more comprehensive look on how we can distribute it, more devices throughout that 
whole corridor. So I again think uh, seeing this project actually come to a reality makes this councilman smile. So thank you. Um, so help me out. Are, are we ready for a vote on this, or are you asking us to go look at these sites? Uh, there's a question about where the tank folks would like it relocated from what's shown here. Um, well, let's just check. Do we, we, we're still in public comment. Do we have any more comments on Zoom? No. I'm sorry. No, we don't. Okay, we so go comment. ahead and you can close public comment. I close, yeah, I didn't see the Zoom, but thanks. Yeah, um, and then we can open this up for council discussion. Okay. Commission discussion. All right. Thank um, I heard about the story at the high school with the 17 year old who dropped. I, I, we need these things. And frankly, I, I ride by that one at the high school every day, and I don't even notice it anymore. Sure. It's a, it's a bit loud, but it's supposed to be. <laughs> so people know where it is. Um, I only just learned how to use one. So, um, you know, I certainly feel if it's, if the Bocce 700 seniors have both paid for it and agreed with the fire chief on where it should go in its best and highest use, um, I motion for a vote on, do we have to do both of them individually or? You could do them both individually. Yeah. Let's do, yeah. I, I motion for a vote on the Patan Court, um, if, unless anyone else has any other comments about it. Yeah, my comment is the um, at the depot park, um, to me, that's one of the more isolated areas of the park, but I think it's more important that we get it in rather than delay deciding is that the perfect spot or not. Let's get it in. It's can always be moved at some later date if not, if we find a better spot. I think, yeah. Trina, did, we didn't get a second to your motion, but did are you mo is your motion to move the one that the city is proposing yeah. to with the one that pay tonk? The pay tonk court. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do we have a second? Uh, I motion for the AED at the Patan courts to be approved. Or to be voted on to go to city council. Sorry, the Bocce and Patonk um, AED. I just, I, and I want to be real clear if the motion is for where staff is recommending the installation of the unit. And that's on the wall at the masonry building that was depicted in the photo just to the west of the baton courts. I think what's unclear to me from the statement maybe is whether or not the Vachi and Patonk folks want it there or not. Oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Okay. They want it in a different location, but by March 25th, ideally. I don't even know if that's feasible. Is that feasible? That's not feasible. Okay. We have more debate on this then. So. Well, I was going to say one thing. Be a good idea, because I I used to hit balls pretty far. I used to hit home runs during practice, and sometimes it bounces over near the court, and I don't want to hit anybody. So I was wondering if they could do like what they did, with like the golf nets. That way, nobody gets hit. That could be taken up as a later item. Oh, okay. Just making suggestions. So the question I have is where do the uh, Bocce and Patonk folks, where do they want it? I mean, we've, we've seen the diagram that, that the fire and the city is recommending. I haven't seen a diagram where the uh, Bocce and Patonk people would prefer Staff, staff could do a little bit more work with Bocce and Patonk and the fire department, and we could come back with a revised location and a schedule for installation of the unit versus being able to put one of these in within the next couple of weeks. 
if that's what the commission wants. I was about to, the tonk people willing to have that extra time for. Can I have a hall pass? Can I have a hall pass? Yes. 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 Thank you. I, 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 I'm trying to follow pro, pro, protocol. Dave Mahoney, the Apache Courts Maintenance Administrator, Big Hat, No Cattle. Um, but the place that we're talking about, Jeanette is talking, it's the light pole that's on the walking path between the bathrooms and the walkway that parts the Patan courts and our body courts. It's central and Volt Electric was out there with Chris Pegg, one of the managers, and at that time they were agreeing on that spot. So now to hear that the electricity isn't powerful enough, that's news. But we still the tower is what we put money in for, not a wall mount. And the tower in that location, to us, is central, visible. It's the best spot. So we would like it to be where we originally asked. And if more visits have to happen, or more work to get the electricity uh, there, that's what we'd like. Is that OK? Could you bring the slide up again? So is it buried in the trees there, the, That's the pole? Photo. Sure. Yeah. You yeah, can't it's buried, see it's, the light pole. It's buried in the trees, kind of. Um, little kid's playground. Yeah. It's like 40 feet from there, 50 feet. It's north of the, it's north of the Bocce and Patan courts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I know the one. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, Mike, is it possible for staff to reevaluate the location, the budget or and or additional costs and schedule for review. And the issue is we're not going to have another meeting potential vote on this for quite some time and then the implementation, right? So I was trying to sort of understand how the schedule is affected by us not voting on this today um, relative to. Yeah, and what, what the commission could do is the commission could authorize staff to, or direct staff to uh, go back and continue working with Bocce and Patonk. We could come up with a revised schedule for construction, and that would be, and, and, and a cost. I'm just, I'm not, I, we, we had, we had an electrician out there and look at it and made a determination. And um, that's why we ended up going with the location that we that we suggested, specified. But if the commission would like to do that, um, and w as our next item, we will talk about uh, different ways of having special meetings between now and our next quarterly meeting. So there will be an opportunity to talk about this within you know less than three months. You're saying that we could have you meet and the staff and reevaluate this, and we could have a, a special meeting to make a vote on this before our next quarterly meeting in June. Well, yeah, and we what we could do is we could come up with um, a schedule for construction and a cost, and if we could find the money to budget for that, um, we could reach out. The, the people that are involved here is the fire department and the the stakeholders that we collaborated with to come up with this location mm -hmm. and we could go back and reach out with that to them and uh, you know let them know what the construction schedule is going to be and if that's the direction that they want to go um, we could start we could start moving in that direction and then bring it up at a at the next commission meeting for concurrence. Mm -hmm. But it kind of seems like a no-brainer that if we come to an agreement with Bocce and Patonk and the fire department and yeah, public works can staff it and Bocce and Patonk can um, handle our schedule, uh, 
then it would it would be acceptable to the commission too. Yeah. Second. A motion to yeah to, to have that have happen. Staff work with it, you can up. advance that. I mean, unless anyone has an objection yep. to it. I think we have to say what we're yeah. moving. What you just said. Um, you have to say what the motion is. A motion to have the staff work with um, reevaluating. Can you lean forward the, so we can hear the you? Construction. Lean forward a bit so oh, sorry. Reevaluate the construction and the time schedule and um, consult with the Payton Bocce group and any other groups that were involved in the funding to see if um, you can reach an agreement. That, that that could be the motion, yes. Second. Is there any further discussion? We'll do a roll call. John Donnelly. Aye. Ka uh, Katrina Lennon. Aye. Jessica Mazaraka. Aye. Charlie Tolbert. Aye. Brendan Tierney. Aye. Okay. Uh, five and out, five oh for the motion. Chair Donnelly, the next item that staff has on the agenda today is item 4.6, creation of ad hoc and or special subcommittees to the pros. Um, item, what staff, what staff presented was three separate categories. We, per the municipal code and the direction of council, we are to establish a tree committee. And we also thought that other areas where um, pros could be interested in establishing um, the tree committee is going to be part of and a, a subset of the pros committee. And that's per the municipal code. If there's other areas where pros would like to the commission would like to um, do further work in between our quarterly meetings look into subjects deeper between our quarterly meetings that's open for discussion with the commission and w what we can do is we can tonight agree or agree to a way to vet dates kind of similar to how I set them up before to have meetings and we could set up we, we have, um, as part of our next item, we have pending items on the that would have been brought to the Tree Commission that have to be discussed. And as part of our special commission, or special committee meetings, we could set up items of business to talk about that are on the Tree Commission agenda, items of business to talk about that could be at the plaza, items of business to talk about that could be at the Depot Park, or any other areas that the commission would like to focus on, and so the, one of the one of the avenues that we have to take care of more business is to set up these special committee meetings and go through and discuss any of these items. Staff would agendize um, based on the commission's input, put together an agenda. We would post it and have another meeting here in the chambers. And really, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and turn this back to you. And if we wanted to, if you had any questions for me, we could, I could field those first, and then we could ask for public comment. Any questions? So on the tree committee, I was on the tree committee when it was under the Community Service and Environmental Commission, and we work with John Messiver, who is the current city arborist. Is he still the arborist that advises on these, or? Public Works works with Mr. Metzler, and um, he's. Uh, we have we have a person who um, submitted an application to be the tree arborist for the or the arborist for the commission, mm -hmm. and that's currently being reviewed.
Does that mean that that the John Messer John, John Reserve? Yeah, he's, John Reserve. He's reapplying, or he's we've not, received the, we've received an application. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, what is the tree committee adjudicating upon? Just proposals to, or applications rather, to remove trees, or can you help me understand? Yeah. So, any trees that are in the public right of way, you have to apply. Um, to remove them and then we ask for an arborist report and we would bring that here and the tree committee would look at those and see if whether or not they would allow them to remove them and replace them or not and uh, with the consultation of the arborist which we don't have now but when that recruitment closes in a couple of weeks we should have somebody so my, my understanding is also that um, because of the planning commission the development projects that go to the planning commission involve removal of trees and replacement, et cetera, uh, that's been separated from the tree committee so that they can speed up the process of the planning review of these projects. Is that correct? Um, I believe, and I look sideways to Rebecca, but I believe that it was because the CSEC and the tree committee were dissolved that that kind of broke apart. So mm -hmm. the ones that were on private property were handled through the planning commission and the ones in the right of way, we haven't really had a mechanism uh -huh. to approve those. But I think the ones in the public right of way and at least the front yard setbacks that are on private property will be coming to the tree commission. Mm -hmm. I can't speak to the whole development process. Yeah. So will the subcommittee effectively adjudicate on that, or they just talk about it, then bring it to us at one of these bigger meetings, and we have to vote? Because I, I don't really want to spend my time voting on every single tree application. I, I believe that the tree committee adjudicates on that, but I would defer to John, who was on the last one, but that's my understanding. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, Commissioner Donald. Yeah, in that, in that regard, I mean, the... We studied the city's municipal codes on these trees, and it wasn't just the ones in a public right-of-way. It was also significant trees that were on private property that if they were significant in terms of size, et cetera, that um, they had to make a case for the removal. And I think those, those are included, too. So the ones that are listed here, almost all of them um, are not in public right-of-way. Some of them are, but there's some that aren't, it looks like. The, all of these ones that I have on this list are on in the public right away because okay. these are ones that have come to public works in the maybe, lack of a tree committee. Maybe should get that clarified for the for the, the tree, committee, tree committee. Yes. Yeah. Like obviously he knows more than me, but I've heard they've been like taking down sequoias and stuff because once the water gets down, they have very weak roots. So they've been sawing down sequoias so they don't you know land on cars and stuff. But I think that's right away. I don't think that's personal property. Oh. You know, but I think yeah, once a tree gets too big and it's raining like this, yeah, I think sometimes you gotta trim them back or yeah. something. I don't know. I just so we need some direction. Uh, can we? There's we, for the tree committee. If it's going to exist under pros, is that up for a vote or is it just no? Who's going to be the pros member on the tree committee? Yeah, and the commission could set it up how they wanted. I would believe that if we handle it as a special meeting, it would be all members. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wait a minute. Are you saying that the subcommittee would come back to the whole? No, he's saying all of them. I think he's that all of us would have to be on the subcommittee, which doesn't make sense. Just to let you know, on tab three, I have the, sorry, I'm too close, the tree ordinance in your binder. So there is our municipal code that has all the information on that, just to give you a little bit of information. So I think what we're not clear on is what the tree, who would, how, what is the membership, how big is it, who else would be on it besides, I, I, my understanding was it would be some representatives from this commission in addition to others, and at that, in the old days, we didn't even bring it back to the uh, Community Service and Environmental Commission, the tree committee met with the arborist and had a meeting with the homeowners or whoever was making the application, 
and we settled at that level. Yeah, so Chair Donnelly, could you please clarify your question? The question is, if they create a tree subcommittee, who on, who is on it? What's the membership? Is it two? I thought there was something like one or two people from this commission together with an arborist. Would there be other members on this commission? And would, would it be a standalone subcommittee that would make its decisions on tree applications? Or would it have to come back to the entire commission here? And when when I spoke with when I spoke with our uh, legal, he consult I consulted with him and he told me that one of the ways to set this up is is that and the, the tree committee is part of pros, and he said in order to have a meeting with the tree committee, one way to do it is to set up a special meeting for the entire commission, and that would include the five commission members, the alternate, the arborist, and the student member, but. There's, there's also, you know, there's a lot of different ways of skinning a cat on this. One of them is set up an ad hoc committee, by, um, which would be two commission members and um, other representatives. We, staff could get clarification on this, but when I did consult with the city attorney, he told me that one way to do this is to set up a special meeting and as part of the agenda, cover the items that are on the that have been brought to Public Works regarding trees. So <clears throat> I would like to revisit that because in my experience on when we were, the tree committee was a subcommittee of the Community Services Environmental Commission. We never brought it back to the full commission. And it's hard enough if you've got six or eight applications of homeowners to have the entire commission have to wrestle with this. So what we did is the subcommittee, tree committee would go out and visit the application sites and see what was involved, consult with the arborist, have the dialogue with the homeowners or, or the developers, and make a decision. But uh, it, it sounds to me like we're getting uh, way too far along with this if we're bringing it to the entire pros commission on these individual applications. So I, I would hope that you could go back and see why we couldn't use the same model we had with the Community Service and Environmental Commission that the tree committee was a subcommittee of that and had its own special meetings. And I could take that back and get clarification on that. Yeah. Could you? Yeah. Please. Thanks. Yeah. I would just like clar clarification in general on the subcommittees. Um, if you could give us specific parameters on how many, like what's the minimum, maximum number of Commissioners on each subcommittee, do we have to join one? Um, things like that. I mean, it sounds like we're, it's a work in progress. So typically when you have an ad hoc committee of a commissioner at the council, it's usually less than a quorum. It's made up of members of the commission, less than a quorum, and typically, and um, in some cases, they can be like what's considered a standing committee. So then they'd be subject to the Brown Act. Um, if the com an ad hoc committee, and you may have remembered this from the orientation, some ad hoc committees are set up for a distinct purpose for a set amount of time, and in that case, it would be again. Um, in this case, you have a. Uh, voting members, I think it's five on this commission, so you would have ad hoc committees of two, um, which is one less than a quorum, and if you had a standing committee, say if you had a standing committee to talk about Plaza Depot Park, um, that might end up, even though you may only have two individuals, you may end up in a situation where that's a Brown Act committee, where you have to go through a notice meeting, follow all the same um, rules and regulations as you do for this meeting tonight. Um, now, if it's an item, say you said, you know, we want, we talked a lot about bathrooms tonight. Say you said we wanted a sub, we would like to have a subcommittee to work on bathrooms. That is for a set project. It's for a set time period, most likely. And once that's done, that committee goes away. That's kind of the difference between the types of committees, if that answers your question. And then do the, do the subcommittees 
basically they do the sort of the footwork, the study, and bring it back to the whole commission if there's a vote needed. I um, think it depends on the, the item. Typically they work with staff um, and then they sometimes, like I think a good one is, well not anymore because now it's a Brown Act committee. Um, say like in the past we had like a finance committee that would look at meet with staff and look at different items in the budget and then they would like kind of you know get a general idea and then they could take that back if that to the Commission if that makes sense and the only caveat there is that the tree committee is not it doesn't it doesn't uh, end it's going to be a standing committee that operates at all times under pros and so it will not uh, twilight at any time it's going to continue and I, I, I while I understand the ad hoc I'm not really clear on setting up a subcommittee and that's why I consulted with the attorney and he told me one way to do it and what council wanted to do when they made the tree committee part of pros was they kind of wanted to confine these committees a little bit and what we could do is we could look into seeing if there's a different way that a po considering it's not an ad hoc committee and it is going to go on in perpetuity where you know if there's a different way to set it up so that all commission members don't have to be there and that we could um, at our next special meeting or quarterly meeting come up with a framework for that I think that would be hopefully something that we could reach agreement on because to bring all these applications to the entire Commission is just going to be a long night for everybody is there any public comment on the Possibility of a city tree committee. Hi, my name is Don Orr. I'm the treasurer, Sonoma Vaji. We have a concern about the eucalyptus trees uh, surrounding the Batanque and Bachi courts. Uh, they're old, the roots are exposed, they're a hazard for people walking, and we see a lot of fungus growing at the bottom of these trees. And we've been waiting for an arborist to give us a, a, an opinion as to whether we got a safety concern uh, with people playing so close to these trees. So um, it's a top priority for us, along with the bathrooms. <laughs> but those trees, they're tall, they're big. And uh, we, like I say, we're very, very concerned about the, the surrounding grounds around it. So thank you. Did you say that the Petang, Bachi people have consulted an arborist, or no. are you making an application? No, we've been waiting for yeah. a, uh, um, a report from Mike. Is that right? You were uh, saying that an arborist was going to look at the trees and give us an opinion? Public comment should address council. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you for your comment. Anything, uh, anybody on Zoom, on trees? I don't see anyone raising their okay. hand. I, there's a high statistic of um, those types of trees um, falling over because of the low roots, like I said before. And I think they should be examined by, you know, somebody to make sure that um, they don't fall because I mean, they fall on cars, they fall on a lot of people. You know, there's been a lot of deaths by certain trees like that because the roots don't hold to the ground as well as other trees. They have small roots. It might be big trees, but they have very small roots. Do we want to close public comment? Yes, I think we do. Unless there's any further comment? Yes, thank you. The, the current item that we have on the agenda that we're talking about is creation of ad hoc subcommittees. Mm -hmm. And we, Chair Donnelly, did we just close public comment for that? 
Or I think we can because we're just talking about whether what the committee's going to be, if there's a concern about the, any tree in the city. It, it needs to, is there still a formal city application process? The ones that are listed here. So, how would they make their app, their uh, concern, their applications to the city to have those trees put on the sub the tree subcommittee, if one exists? Oh, the formal application process is. Um, well, they're for, for front yard trees, so trees that you have responsibility for as the homeowner. The eucalyptus trees are on uh, public city property, so mm -hmm. I think uh, contacting staff for resources to do the assessment is the correct method, which I think they have done. Yeah, I don't believe if we were to remove them and we got an arborist report, then staff would present that as our own trees to the mm -hmm. tree committee. Okay. So I, I guess. Uh, the main thing is we need to hire an expert, right? And none of us are experts sitting up here. And so um, if that is on the agenda, like is there somebody in, I know you said somebody had applied for the position. Is that an active role you're looking to fill? And will that person be deployed to um, such examinations as the eucalyptus trees near the bocce courts? Yeah, and if the commission is, is um, requesting a little bit more information on the comments made a public comment about the eucalyptus trees at Bocce. Yes. Uh, on February 22nd, we wrote an email to Bocce re in response to an email from uh, Bocce Patonk that basically stated a more detailed arborist report on the current status of the trees will be forthcoming and the author will share it as soon as possible. Uh, since then, we've scheduled that and that, uh, that inspection of the trees is scheduled to happen this week. Great. Yeah. And so you will come back to us presumably with whatever that report says for we can talk about on the next agenda. Yeah, we can be, make that available. Great. Anybody? So do we have some clear instructions on how to proceed with how to set up this tree committee? I, I'm not, I'm still a little bit uh, not clear. I don't, any of us are really. Um, well, we, one, one thing that we can do is we can have, we can set up a special meeting to further discuss this mm -hmm. in between now and our next quarterly meeting. Okay. And then what I can do is I can research if there's additional ways to take on that item other than having the full commission review, be on the um, tree committee. Thank you. If just if I can, Mike, um, I did look at the ordinance that was most recently enacted um, when the pros and the Climate Action Commission were um, put into place, and the entire portion of the municipal code there was a portion that was repealed and its entirety and replaced by the following tree committee means the Parks, Recreation, and Open Space Committee. So there is some definitely, I think we, you want to talk with legal because there's another area that talks that the tree committee um, advises the commission. So we just, I think you want to clarify that for sure. I was, I was just curious, uh, like parks and recreation, that involves trees though, right? Like taking care of the trees and the landscape? Yes. Okay. Rebecca, what, what paragraph for you and I have that right here? It's um, under definitions. And, and that's okay. Your concerns are noted. We'll, we'll go back. We'll take a look at the ordinance and the municipal code, and we'll see if there isn't a way that we could streamline that. And, yeah, we'll take a look and see. Thank you. You do, you do have public comment on Zoom. Sorry. Public comment on Zoom? Did we close it? We can, we can open it real quick. Hi, uh, this is this is St. John Bain. I was just um, um, got a double speaker going here. Hold on, I'm gonna turn off this, turn off the speaker. Um, sorry, 
Um, I just wanted to make a comment. I, I believe there was a lot of discussion. I think Rebecca was talking about Brown Act v verbiage for ad hoc or advisory committees. And I'm, I'm seeing language that uh, indicates that uh, the Brown, uh, Brown Act will not apply to ad hoc committees as long as that they meet certain conditions. Um, it's, 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 it's the, either an advisory or an ad hoc committee will be able to operate um, without Brown Act restrictions, I believe, based on language I've seen. It would be really good to clear that up specifically as soon as possible so that we can make the right decisions here so we can get uh, subcommittees, whether t termed ad hoc or advisory. Um, it may be that it, they need to be called advisory committees, but we should be able to uh, have committees, subcommittees operating without Brown Act restriction. So I just hope we make sure we examine these um, very quickly. Yeah, I'll just add that my, you know, when we had the, again, the model of the tree committee that was on under the Community Service Environmental Commission, if, if the applicants were not happy with our decision, they could appeal to the council. So wouldn't it be possible to set this up that if they're not happy with this ad hoc tree committee's decision, they could appeal to the commission as a whole? Yeah. Yeah, well, we're gonna have to look. We're gonna have to look at the okay. municipal code and the um, and the item. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. We'll we'll clarify this and get this get this straightened out. Yeah. And if if there's no further comments from the commission on setting up these types and if you had any ideas about different areas where you'd like to set up potentially ad hoc committees um, you can be thinking about that and either get back to us later or right now well the only one that came up earlier was the parklets issue and um, I'm not sure I mean a lot of those park they're on city streets in public but they're basically operated by private establishments right restaurants and yeah, that's 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 not an agendized item. That isn't probably going to fall anytime soon under the scope of this commission. Yeah, and if we're if we're if the commission's done, we can go ahead and move on to our next agenda item. Yes, for item four point seven and item four point seven. Um, really, what we want to do is we just want to bring these to your attention tonight. We want to let you know that there are six trees that we have on our list that have been in the system for a little while because we haven't had a tree commission. And if we were to have a uh, special meeting up in the future, these would be items that we could consider uh, are the pending applications for tree removal. And Mike, what is the process whereby which we can determine if we should agree to these trees? Like, what is the merit of these applications? How do we adjudicate on that? I would actually defer to Chair Chairman Donnelly, who's been on a tree committee. But my understanding is that with the arborist, who we hopefully will have after okay. the date closes, they we pretty much follow their advice. We ask for arborist reports, and the homeowners can come and present their case. Um, and then with the advice of our arborist, and in consultation with whomever is on the ad hoc, it would be, they would make a decision. And we'd see a full application for each of these. Correct. Yeah. Any public comment? Ron. Yes. Um, it has to do with the removal of trees as a whole. And um, I th would strongly suggest that in consideration of removing trees, whether they're any of the six that have been brought before, they'll be addressed later. I think it's a, it's very important to set the parameters, not only tree removal, 
but I want to see tree replacement because I live in a, a housing tract that was built in 1990. And this was back when I was too busy doing other things and being concerned about my community. And that is I kept seeing street trees disappearing, never replaced. And so I go into my housing tract right now or my subdivision and I see <clears throat> pistache trees that are pretty modest in growth for 30 years. But there's all these missing spots. So I think it's real easy to have a process to approve removal of trees, but I think it's equally as important to make sure that as part of the process, we have a commitment either by the city, the homeowner, or whoever's responsible uh, party uh, be putting a replacement tree in and probably more importantly, to be put in properly because I'm at, uh, um, a landscape architect that feels that the vast majority of street trees that have been put in for the last 30 years have been put in in a less than effective way to give good results. And I can bore you on a story with coffee sometime on it, but again, I just strongly encourage you, if you are going to be the body to review the removal of trees, part of the decision should also include a commitment of replacing that fallen tree, which means you gotta grind that stump out. And it's easy to cut down a tree, but it just seems like we lose the value or we don't recognize the value of replacing the tree. Thank you. Any further public comment? I'll make this quick because I had almost three minutes. I just wanna submit for your review a little bit of research done on uh, wood decay fungus in trees. The, the mushrooms growing in the eucalyptus trees are inside the trunk, not just on the base, which means it's rotting from the inside out, which means it's highly susceptible to going over. And uh, I just want you to be highly aware of that in terms of the liability to the city and potential damage to individuals. So I don't know, can I submit this? Okay, moving right along. Any more public comment? Okay, everybody's gone to bed probably. <laughs> Just further discussion by the commission on this item. Further discussion on this. We're waiting for clarification from you about how the. Well, in this item, pen, yeah, just tree removal applications yeah. um, as part of uh, item six. I'm just going to bring up that we could set up a special meeting. Okay. So we have that to, uh, option to discuss to bring up further items like this. And we'll have the new city arborist on board at that point. We're hoping. Yeah. Without the arborist, will we? <laughs> We're being uh, not up to full speed. Our skill set isn't quite there yet, I think. We'll be stumped. I have a quick question. So tree removal, is that not a part of the tree committee's domain? Or is it separate? Yes, yes it is. Part of tree, tree committee? Yes. Okay. And if that's it for the commission discussion, we'll go ahead and move on to item number five, which is pros members reports and comments. Uh -huh. <laughs> we finally arrived. Yeah. Anybody have a comment? This is just general discussion. Yeah. Um, I join this to, to make a difference and to, to move things ahead. And I feel like there's just a lot of low-hanging fruit here in Sonoma. And these bigger items that I'm sure we will discuss um, at length and important items are great. Um, I would just encourage my fellow council members between now and our next, you know, we're only meeting four times a year. So we could potentially meet additional times, but in reality, that's the framework with which we're operating under right now. And so I would encourage everybody to really think about the priorities they wanna see and adjudicate on 
at each, you know, this is our first meeting, but the next one so that what is our legacy going to be at the end of 2023? What can we say that we will have achieved? Um, it's really important to not lose sight of that in, in and amongst all the bylaws and municipal codes and such. Um, so we'll obviously do our best to operate within the framework that we have, but um, you know, I'd like to see us be both enabled to make decisions, you know, going forward as best we can and, and have all the information ahead of time, you know, presented by staff and by members of the public who have um, issues they want to raise. Um, encourage the public too to reach out to pros members in between sessions to talk about you know what's important to the community as well so that we can erase them as agenda items and get more up to speed on it ahead of these meetings so that's all thank you I just have a couple quick general um, questions probably of Rebecca um, is there a limit to the length of time of any commission meeting how does that work? Are you referring to like tonight, how long the meeting is? I just mean generally speaking. I mean, is there a... Yeah, there's, there's not a hard and fast rule. Um, something that the council has implemented is that at nine o'clock, they have to stop and take a vote if they're going to continue the business of the commission past that time. Um, that's something that they do. Um, so as far as, you know, Yes, you have to be done by nine o'clock. No, there's not, but that is something that the council does. I just had one other question. One thing that would really help, I think, is to have page numbers on the agenda and also section numbers to refer to what's in the, um, you know, the index of the agenda, if that's at all possible. So I don't know if you're familiar with the way the city council and planning commission agendas look. Um, they are set up differently because and it's our agenda management system because this is a new commission um, we have to go through some implementation on our agenda management system that is our goal to make it um, operate the same way that those agendas do where you can actually ac um, access it on your devices um, using an app that we would provide for you um, we're not there yet. We're getting there. For right now, for this first meeting, we had to do it as an import. That's why it looked a little differently. Yeah, your first comment about the length of meetings always makes me think of Oscar Wilde, who said the trouble with socialism is that it takes too many evenings, and we could just change that to democratic citizen input, and here we are. But um, yeah, I, I just want to f follow up on this issue of the Measure M money that. You know, we, according to the uh, oversight committee reports I've seen for Sonoma, we've already spent ninety-seven thousand dollars for the for, from the, and we have a balance of like three hundred and seventeen thousand, with about a hundred and fifty coming in each year going forward. So I would I would hope that we could we could pick up where we left off with the task force phase three into phase four and have a a special session with the benchmark uh, Potero Group's recommendations, what they, what they found out, and develop a plan of how we can find out through better communication with the community what people's response to the recommendations of the Potero Group are and what new input would help us shape where we think the critical needs are that we should be prioritizing some of the measure and money. So is it possible to have um, a study group or a special session as you I need your advice on this and rather than wait and agendize it for a June meeting and if if that's the last comment from Council or from the Commission I, I think it's a great time to step into 6.1 which is our meeting schedule mm -hmm. and what Rebecca and I were just discussing a second ago is that we'll probably have an arborist on board at the end of April likely at the end of April okay. and so what we would propose is I can send out some tentative dates like I did to set our, our agenda and the Commission could reply back to me on their availability and we could set up a meeting for mid to the end of April to discuss that along and it, this would be a full Commission meeting mm -hmm. yeah where we'd have uh, possibly Karen and 
Collins and Steve from the task force as well as we could we could look into having Karen at that meeting but I'm I would defer to the June 14th meeting for that mm -hmm. yeah and then take care of any other business that we had in this special meeting so the agenda for the special meeting would be what again? <clears throat> we're gonna make it uh -huh. we're gonna make it we're gonna make it okay yeah um myself and oriana staff working with you okay point and then getting um putting together some uh staff agenda items and that could be um also the commission okay what items the commission would like to bring up okay yeah can you um summarize maybe in a sentence or two for the edification of the commission exactly what measure m is measure you can help me on this too but measure m was a one eight sales tax that was passed in 2019 i believe at first they tried to only fund the county parks and uh, the nine cities said wait a minute we want to share so it was redone and it passed by 75 percent vote so two-thirds of the measure m sales tax money goes to the county parks i think maxwell park is part of that development right now and the one-third goes to the nine Sonoma cities. Our share is roughly 150 or 40,000 a year for 10 years. So we're already in the fourth year at this point. And the task force, um, and it is my understanding is that it's, um, I don't know if I have the actual, it, uh, here it is, that uh, the cities and counties can use the money to invest in maintenance of parks, trails, signs, buildings, improve playgrounds, sports, fields, restrooms, um, picnic areas and visitor centers, improve park access, and, the, and then so forth. And it finally says, uh, offer recreation, education, and health programs in the parks. So it's pretty much park oriented as, as I read this. And I would get, we have this meeting and have this discussion. I think that's really important to know mm -hmm. what, what we can and can't do with, with the Measure M money. Yeah, you nailed the the parts that for the city, it's just a population base, so it fluctuates a little bit depending on how big or small you are. So Santa Rosa gets more than us, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's about one hundred and fifty thousand. And you have to bring your projects to their oversight board. So the project that we're currently working on is for the Depot Park restrooms. We have it in design, and that's where um, the the fund that you're seeing in there, that three hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars that we're still sitting on, is allocated to do that restroom. Um, interior and exterior and upgrade the ADA pathway that we have to do because we're doing the restroom. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the project that we have on the slate, but any the for further projects we can discuss here. And we'll find out who the new um, Citizen Oversight Committee representative is. Also, that would be helpful. When I just looked at the um, county's website for the Oversight Commission, it says there's one vacancy, but it's a Board of Supervisors appointment. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, but it's for our, our city, isn't it? It, I mean, it does not say which city it is. Yeah. District 1 already does have an appointment. Uh -huh. So, and I believe we are, are we District 1? I know that's our supervisory district. We we are District One. Um, we had a, a oversight meeting last week, and there the representative for Sonoma wasn't there, so maybe they were just absent. But so I'm not sure whom it is since Karen left. It says the District One is I think Leslie Groves is the name. Yeah. You could, if you could find out, that would be helpful for us to know too. Who who's representing to the county how the city's using its Measure M money, because that's information we, I think our commission would need. So if we're in agreement to have a special meeting in, uh, towards the end of April? Yes, thank you. Commission thinks that's a good idea? Great. All, all staff will reach out and we'll set that up similar to the way that we did. Any comments on the June 14th, September 13th, or December th 13th? meetings that we've already agreed to? They're fine with me. Excellent. I have one question. Uh, between now and the end of April meeting, um, how do we 
be productive and accomplish anything between now and then. What what any suggestions? Staff will be corresponding the way that I have been and we'll lay out we've been taking notes, we'll go back, we'll look at the video, we'll see what the talking points were, what the points of interest were for the meeting, and we will reach out to the commission with a correspondent. At that point, it's really trying to, you know, this, this is a brand new commission, it's brand new commission members, um, this is the first meeting like this that I've ever done this much work at, other than doing a presentation or two and answering a few questions. So realistically, just reflecting on how things went, how we can make things better, thinking about the future and thinking about the areas that we want to get involved in. What we're going to do is we're going to get back to the commission with some of the guidelines regarding some of the questions that we had, like setting up committees, any sort of ad hoc uh, information that we can get back to the commission, do, how, how we're going to handle the tree issues. And then as you see those e those emails coming by, you know, you feel free to respond back to me. I'll be working with the chair and s trying to set an agenda with the chair for our next meeting. That's pretty much the way that flows, right, Rebecca? <laughs> I'll, I'll set that up with the chair. I mean, that, it, that's kind of the way that uh, the city manager does it with the mayor, right? As far as placing items on the agenda? Yeah. Yeah, typically, um, like at the council level, it's two um, council members can request an item or the mayor and the city manager. So. Yeah, so that. there's different protocols, and we'll, we'll push some of those ground rules out to, to come up with new items for the next agenda. And, you know, two months will be here before you know it, so... <laughs> 